I'd like to call to order the joint meeting of the Anchorage Assembly and the Matsu Borough Assembly. Um, uh, Madam Clerk, if you do a roll call for the Anchorage Assembly. Mr. Croft. Present. Hatcher. Mr. Rivera. Present. Hatcher. Mr. Constant. Here. Mr. Dunbar. Here. Mr. Dyson. I, I see Mr. Dyson. Ms. Quinn Davidson. She's excused. Mr. Traney. Mr. Traney asked to join you probably about 10 to 1. He has a class this okay. morning. Mr. Weddleton. Here. Ms. Weimar. Here. And I'll, oh, I'm sorry. And I'll do the Matt Subaru. Jim Sykes. Here. Matthew Beck will not be present. George McKee. I'm expecting Ted Leonard. Here. Dan Mayfield. Here. Jesse Sumner. Here. And Tam Bovey will also not be present. Thank you all for attending. We typically start with the Pledge of Allegiance. The flag is over there. All start us off. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We did a roll, uh, so we are uh, recording this, of course. It's a, it's a noticed meeting. Uh, so if everyone could put their loudest voices on. We also have two <coughs> mics operating. So to the extent you're away from this recorder or have a quiet voice, few of us are burdened with that. But um, uh, uh, use the microphone. We'll ask you to speak up if we can. I'd, I'd like to have introductions just because a lot of this meeting is for us to get to know each other, to talk about... Uh, issues of concern. You can see it's a very general agenda. Um, we're not going to enact anything, of course, but even, I think, uh, get down to specific proposals so much as uh, figuring out areas where we can work together. I, I, I appreciate the uh, Borough Assembly um, keeping this on the agenda. We both, uh, both of us in our, in our bodies have um, things that keep us engaged day to day and so sometimes we forget about the bigger picture and reminding us to, to have this conversation and see where we can work together is important. So maybe we can go uh, clockwise around and introduce each other and then also loudly if the people who are not at the table, some of which we'll want to bring up, can can uh, say that they're here. Um, that'd be great. So I'm Eric Croft, Chair of the Anchorage Assembly. Uh, Dan Mayfield, I'm uh, the Assembly Representative for uh, District 5 in, uh, in the Matsu. Uh, it encompasses the Port Mac area, Big Lake, uh, and Settlers Bay area, where the fastest growing area in the world. Uh, Jesse Sumner, Assembly District 6. Uh, it's the area from Church to Palmer Bishop, north of Wasilla. Yell, Miss LaFrance. Oh, sorry. sorry. Right. <coughs> Pete will show you how here. Yeah. Oh, it's thumbs up, but it's also louder. Yeah. Pump up the uh, volume. Pete Peterson. I represent uh, District 5 in Anchorage. <coughs> uh, it's Muldoon in East Anchorage. Um, I'm also chair of the Ethics and Election Committee, and we worked for four plus years to uh, get the center open and have a vote by mail election last April. So, welcome. Um, I'm Gretchen Wemhoff, and I represent Chigiak Eagle River, a part of Jay Bear, and a tiny corner of Northeast Anchorage that is not covered by Mr. Dunbar and Mr. Peterson. Transportation's the name of my game, and uh, I'm excited to be here for three and a half months. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jim Sykes from District 1, number 1, uh, which goes all the way from Nick River to Lake Louise sticks out towards the colony schools. It's a gigantic district that uh, has some of the most interesting communities in the borough. And uh, I'm also concerned about transport and septage and fish. And you might think those are strange mix, but really they, they do have some of the same aspects to them. Hello, I'm uh, Ted Leonard. I represent uh, pretty much Wasilla and the greater Wasilla area. Share with Dan. And George, uh, I am one of the com 
commuters the uh, commute to Anchorage, so definitely interested in transportation and how we work together. Uh, percent of our, the percentage of our population does commute into Anchorage, and it's very important. I think that we have a good connection and dialogue. So that, that microphone is picking things up pretty well, so uh, yeah, you can just pass it along. Okay. Or to the extent anyone can, use the microphone because it's helping for the recording. Thank Mr. you. Thank you. John Weddleton, I represent with Suzanne uh, South Anchorage, and I'm uh, chair of the Community and Economic Development Committee, which does an awful lot of marijuana licensing and rule changes, and also on the AMATS Policy Committee, which is our MPO for federal funds. Usually we can hear you, Mr. Dyson, but that's good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Fred Dyson, uh, Eagle River Chugach. Uh, and I'm interested in certainly the transportation link. We had a good, another good example of the, how fragile that is this morning. I have to own a piece of property in the absolute north end of uh, Matsu, five acres of open to entry land up there against the border. <coughs> on our public safety committee and I think our legislative affairs one more interested in those issues uh, be very interested uh, we have a combination of a very big city and then some areas that are pretty rural and with some different building codes and I know you guys struggle with those things uh, people in the borough want their freedom but they also want you to do everything else for them and, uh, and how that goes uh, uh, we used to do this. I served on the assembly 30 years ago. We used to annually have a joint meeting of the boroughs, assemblies, uh, of the entire ro road network, rail bill. That was very interesting. After hours, we'd have a spirited discussion of whose district had the most nutcakes. <laughs> Generally, Homer won, but in those days, Matt Sue was, was in the running. Anyways, I'm delighted we're doing this. Eagle River for the show, though. Um. <laughs> um, good morning. Uh, my name is John Moosey. I'm the Matt Nuska Susitna Borough Manager and proud member of today's Orange Team. Send the other one back that way. Yeah, thanks. Uh, good morning. My name is Felix Rivera. Uh, I am the Vice Chair and uh, represent District 4 along with uh, my colleague Dick Training, uh, which is Midtown. Um, so that's uh, everything that's left after you carve out the rest of the districts um, and uh, also chair of the assembly committee on homelessness so aside from services for those experiencing homelessness deal a lot in housing and addiction uh, issues morning i'm forrest dunbar along with uh, mr peterson i represent east anchorage district five uh, and despite the gerrymander of Turpin uh, in Eagle River, we're still the most populous district in the city, which I think makes us the most populous legislative area in the state. By populous, I think he means populated. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my name is Christopher Constant. I represent this district right here, the downtown number one in Anchorage. And um, this is the urban core. It has issues that are somewhat different than the rest of Anchorage and the concentration of all kinds of good and not so good elements. And I currently am chairing the Utilities and Enterprise Committee with Mr. Trainee, uh, co-chairing, and we're kind of wrangling. Previously, we worked on the MLMP transaction, and now looking at the Port of Alaska and figuring out what the path forward is to ensure that that's done in a way that is uh, successful and yet not bankrupt our city or our state or the people who um, utilize goods and services that come across that port and um, I'm really glad to have this conversation my neighborhood is also the location of one of the biggest transportation challenges in the state and that's how to create that um, non-stop method through the city for traffic that isn't stopping in Anchorage that's the kind of previous highway to highway the Glen to Seward connection and that does connect to this issue that people continue to talk about how do we get folks out to the valley so glad for this meeting thank you thank you all and then if the other uh people that are here could just use the microphone sorry for having you and just tell us who you are for the record we'll have a complete showing 
I'm Barbara Jones, Anchorage Municipal Clerk. I'm Lisa Slusner, I'm the Deputy Municipal Clerk. Good morning, I'm Jude Miller from the Capital Projects Director for the Matsu Borough. I'm Ben Coleman, uh, Planner for the Matsu Borough. Uh, Nick Sparopoulos, I'm the borough attorney. I'm also on team orange with John. I tell him what not to do and then get him out of trouble when he doesn't listen. Yeah. Hi, I'm Lonnie McKechnie. I'm the Madison Borough Clerk. And then we have microphone going there. So. Hello, I'm Patty Sullivan, Public Affairs Director, Matsu Borough. I think it's off. Hello, Patty Good. Sullivan, Public Affairs Director, Matsu Borough. Well, we're Anderson. I'm a resident of the borough, just a public citizen. Uh, I'm also a transit advocate, particularly commuter rail, and I served on the governor's uh, commuter rail task force. Good morning. My name is Jamie Acton. I'm the director of public transportation, and prior to that, I was the senior planner for AMATS, the MPO in Anchorage. I'm Bert Cottle. I'm the mayor of the city of Wasilla. I'm Lynn Carden, the deputy administrator for the city of Wasilla. Good morning, I'm Stu Graham. I'm the Government Affairs Representative uh, for MTA, which is the telecom, the co-op telecom serving Eagle River, uh, you know, all the way up uh, to Clear and across to uh, Glacier View. So we're very interested in the transportation corridors and the areas that that opens up and how we can serve those areas. Thank you. The man who needs no introduction. <laughs> we all know you. <laughs> well, I'm Paul Hayman to represent myself. We also have members of the press here. The, um, Bert, do you want to come up? Any other elected officials? Um, yeah. Uh, um, so, uh, as you can see, the agenda is pretty um, general. Uh, a lot of this meeting is for us to identify issues rather than solve them or uh, um, hear. But uh, I did ask, I, I talked to the mayor this morning and asked for uh, uh, transportation and uh, our new AWU director uh, to come in. Didn't feel like I needed to take their time for the full three hours, so when we have them, I'd like to use them. Um, so we have Ms. Acton here. Um, on transportation who, from the Matsu, who, how does that fall? Uh, you guys are pointing at each other. <laughs> Okay, so what I'd like to, but we can we can do this however um, uh, you guys would want. We can make this a meeting that works for you. Is um, I'd like to make a list of things that we'd like to uh, discuss. You started that, Mr. Dyson. I appreciate it on what you wanted to hear, and then to the extent we have uh, staff here that can help us, and they need to go someplace else, we'll prioritize those. We'll put those up and. And so I'd queue up uh, transportation uh, first because Ms. Acton's here. If uh, Mark, how do you say his last name? The new AWU director, Corzin Stein. Anyway, we're, we're just getting used to him. Uh, comes in, we may switch over to sewage. What, to anyone of the elected members, are the things that you would like to discuss? Ro roads and maybe rail. You said roads, but others have said rail on the transportation. Earthquake impacts, I thought I heard, and uh, Ms. Wim Hof. Um, bus and joint funding. Um, we, have, we have buses that pass by to the Eddie Quarter. There you go. But, so uh, roads, rail, and bus all under transportation, but we can break it out. Yeah, you missed mine completely. Okay. What you got? Go ahead. I didn't say anything about earthquakes. Okay. And, uh, and I'm also interested in uh, the borough's experience with semi-rural areas and the urban uh, the bigger cities and the tension that brings. I'd like also somebody to ask, tell us a little bit about do you have any homeless issues? Semi-rural, rural interchange interaction and homelessness issues. Better? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Sykes and I had talked about um, Sewage issues, uh, most of uh, your folks are on septic with a small amount on two different water systems, right? And most of our folks are on water systems with some people on uh, septic, uh, so we sort of flip that around. Um, we, as I understand it, have two places where uh, septic can be dumped, um, and the northernmost one may be uh, closing or remodeling, which would leave Matsu people going all the way to King Street, and so talking about that, Impacts and how we uh, do that. So uh, sewage, 
um, trash and recycling. What other issues are interesting to people? Mr. Sykes. I, I would like to mention fish. Uh, we have a lot of fish issues in common. It won't take long. Fish, excellent. We love fish. Um, yeah, sir. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd also like to uh, uh, maybe learn a little bit more from uh, the Anchorage Assembly in, in regard to the uh, impact that the port uh, repairs uh, may mean to the state. And uh, also uh, to maybe uh, touch on education to see if we have any consensus as to uh, um, possible funding uh, on education. Capital or operating or both, right? Yeah, right. Right. Got that. This went from almost nothing to talk about to too much to talk about pretty quickly. Mr. Weddleton. Uh, wildfire and bears. I'd like to hear what you guys are doing. Separate or well, bears and... Separate issues. Yeah. Other general categories they'd like... the bears to fight the wildfires. <laughs> Smokey bear Smoky fights bear. wildfires. Um, <laughs> Yes, Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would be interested in an update from Matt Sue on, oh, on how the borough is dealing with public safety challenges, particularly with the pullout of the troopers <coughs> from certain areas. Public safety slash troopers, got it. Others. All right, you can bring them up as they go, but we'll take this as an as a agenda of things we at least want to touch today. While we have Ms. Acton, um, let's talk about transportation, roads, rail, bus. Um, and as, as I said at the beginning, this is very general, so any member can talk about their concerns. We'll try and get uh, questions answered while we have staff. Um, the floor is open on transportation. Mr. Sykes. Um, I, I came to listen mainly, but I, uh, I did want to uh, just note that I provided two documents. One has a comment on it and uh, sort of a, a little side remark about doing, dealing with transportation and not being stupid on the other side. And the other document is uh, uh, from the Department of Transportation. The, the previous administration, and it, and it has the three goals that the governor's um, committee on transportation, the rail, the commuter rail task force, left with. So it's just a reference. Those are this is a reference document as to where they left off, and they haven't gotten back together again, as far as I know. So, Mr. Cottle, you sent this uh, letter along with our mayor, uh, Mr. Berkowitz. Um, this was in August. Has there been any response? talking about rail transportation yeah uh, basically I would say under this administration I think that's on hold I don't think you, I don't think you're gonna see any rail transportation expansion for a lot of different reasons but I th there was four and a half million dollars in the last governor's budget and that was taken out so I would for say a pilot program or for what purpose yes, yes. so yeah that was taken out before they got out of session but um, and, yeah I would say right now, I think it's on hold. Unless Lamar's here, you, you see it going in with, yeah, yeah. And so, so our focus has changed now uh, on between the two of us uh, on moving people back and forth to go to uh, buses and look at uh, bus improvements where more people will want to ride buses. Um, and we're all, I know on our end, we're also looking at a bigger parking lot, a 10 acre parking lot where people could actually do more parking rides. And, and then try and work with corporate America to see if we can get more people riding buses and, and be offset on that. But I, I, don't, I don't see it going anywhere right now. So to be clear, the, the four million was taken out before this administration was taken out in the last legislative session. Correct, and the new governor's also said that he's not a proponent of a rail at this point. Okay, you asked about buses, so uh, and Miss Acton, so is there a uh, joint plan or individual plans on how, if not rail, we do buses to better serve the commuters that come back and forth? Sorry, I'll just stand. Um, yes, uh, right now there's a draft agreement with uh, MOA legal that is how we can better look to coordinate our transportation services up and down the uh, Glen Highway. Um, so like Mayor Cuddle mentioned, 
that will look like a lot of different things, whether it's uh, maximizing our existing band pool program that we already invest in, um, and also looking at how we can coordinate better with the transportation providers that are coming from the Valley into Anchorage, or uh, vice versa. So we're definitely looking at how we can better coordinate, looking at some of the older plans and studies that have already been done um, regarding the Regional Transit Authority, and how we can already leverage uh, what those recommendations uh, were made and how those could be implemented. So is there a joint busing or transportation task force of, is it informal or is it? Like so currently it's informal. That's yeah. what the document with legal right now is looking to kind of shore up and formalize. Okay, so who's been meeting with who, just generally? So we had a meeting in October with uh, the five mayors uh, from the borough and our mayor, and so that is to form formalize that agreement so that we can move forward. Okay, October, and it's being finalized, and you were yeah, involved? You, yeah, you guys have the draft right now, so we're waiting on finalization from your legal review so we can move forward. And the, uh, you may say, but the broad outlines of it, I know it's in legal review, but the broad outlines are, one more time. How do we coordinate service? How do we coordinate uh, funding? How do we coordinate the different vehicle types and the existing programs? And then Ms. Wimhoff or, or Mr. Dyson, but as you mentioned, a lot of these commuters go past your area. Um, in, in I, oh, thank you. Um, I'm a former member of the Public Transit yes, you are. Advisory Board. And so sure. we've, we've had some of these conversations, as is Mr. Felix Rivera. Um, my my Mr. biggest Felix. concern is that things go past because of um, policies of funding. Sometimes funding is not does not permit um, a bus to start in Wasilla and drop by Eagle River and go into Anchorage. It can only go from Wasilla or Palmer into Anchorage. And so my concern has always been, of course, um, adding more routes. There's 14 routes that go by Eagle River every day with the Valley Mover, but none of them can stop in Eagle River, whereas the, our, our service to Eagle River is only morning and evening for those commuters. And so um, I just, uh, I know that there's always rules, but you know, I like to find the right thing to do. And that's my concern, is that we can utilize those buses to also pick up Chugiak Eagle River folks. Ms. Acton and uh, Mayor Cottle, what's the best way for that concern that, that Gretchen and Fred have expressed to be reflected in your ongoing discussions? Probably the most secure place we would have for pickup is the Clutena Flats where all the squad cars park. I mean, 10% of your Anchorage Police Department already parks there. I've got three of my cars that park there now because of, because of the requirements. <coughs> That would be actually the perfect place, security-wise and for other reasons, to actually do a pickup if they could get to that location. I mean, you already got 60-some, 70-some police it's, cars parking there. It's so. 10 miles from Eagle River. Right, too so far. I'm just, I'm yeah, but it's it possible to swing through Eagle River to the bus stops that are already right. made for buses. Do you jump right to yeah. the solution, to the, to no. the thing? What is the best way for this concern to get reflected in your I'm ongoing gonna, process? I be yeah. Now? I think you'd be at the next meeting and we'll fix it. I'm in. All right, that's well, what I want. Sure that uh, Ms. Weinhardt <laughs> is invited. <laughs> It may, I may be underestimating this crew, we may be able to resolve all these issues, but I think what we'll be able to do is just understand them and understand how we proceed with them. If we want to get past that to actually writing it down, or like implementing it, it may take all day. Thing? If you do it through the microphone, you're hard to train. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry. So in 2012, 2013, there was a senator out of Eagle River, yeah. and we were, the same discussion come up, and I remember being there when the senator had already given a million dollars to DOT and Alaska State Troopers because the troopers had shot somebody on the, on the road out here and shut down all four lanes for what, eight hours, 10 hours? And so money was appropriated 2012, 2013? I say 13. Okay, 2013. That's and one year later when we had the meeting, yeah. still yeah. nothing yeah. had yeah. been done. And at that time, we were looking at putting up signs that said, you know, road closed, shooting in progress, or whatever the signs were. And we were going to put cutoffs cut across in between the, the four lanes. That still hasn't been done. And Senator, when was that? I remember you got vocal during that meeting and a little bit. Yeah. So, uh, and it's the very thing I was going to bring up, and Shelly Hughes uh, was very active in that. Quite a few of those turn throughs have happened in the, in the Anchorage area. So it's a, you could get back and go the other way if the road's closed. 
the issue of public safety shutting down the roads for that. that improvement at least. My chief of staff, like for our police chief, we really got after the troopers and the cops that they would not only get the evidence they need to go to court with, but they were responsible to clear the darn roads so people can move. The technology is there. I think that is largely solved. One, one of the things I was really hot on at the time is those reader boards. There's one in the north end, isn't there? And we got one just past Muldoon, and when you're headed north, and what I we wanted is real-time use of those things, where literally a cop could call in and say, this road is, is an accident, it's really slippery, like this morning, or whatever, and with in minutes, like a half hour, those reader boards are telling the people getting on the highway at either end that real time what's happening with update. Does anybody know if that's happened and operating? It doesn't look to me like it is on the one by Muldoon. And, and that's the, the, the stuff is there, you know, and I mean, the hardware, it's, it's just an administrative issue. I got to get it. It's very difficult to express my frustration. <laughs> you're doing it. I think you're doing a fine job. Mr. Constant actually waited to be recognized, people. Um, and Yeah, I know. Thank you. Um, so we're talking about a bunch of details that are really important, but they're not to the core of the item on the agenda, and that's the MPO, the Metropolitan Planning Organization. And I think that at the core of all of these conversations is how do we coordinate between our two communities in a very in-depth way and also the state because the state is a critical funder and also a barrier in a lot of these efforts that we try to do and so I think I would like to hear more about the crafting of the Matsu MPO because we have a long-standing group AMATS and it's interesting to see how that process works the local body comes up with proposals and asks for uh, the, the documents that guide our development with the state partnerships to have a certain flavor, which generally tends to be let's honor the local needs. And almost universally, those processes flip somewhere along the way, and they suddenly just honor the statewide transportation needs. And um, oftentimes we hear, because I've sat on AMATS on the alternate at this time, that, oh no, in the Matsu, that they don't want that. That's, this is what they want. And so we're triangulated. And I think we can do a lot better if we have a peer organization out there that works closely on these issues. And so I'm very interested to hear the progress on the MPO and the Matsu and uh, get that part of this topic going. Because all of the public transit issues will be funneled through that process, all of the funding mechanisms, not all of them, but many of them. And also the development plans for larger infrastructure projects, they all seem to have a nexus through that. Who can tell us more about the development of that? Jim, can you, uh, can you chime can, in? I can, I can say Thank you. So uh, ultimately the, the final makeup of the MPO is gonna be decided by the governor. Um, at the same time, um, it, it makes a lot of sense for, for the, the Matsu borough and the cities um, to, be rep uh, to, rep uh, to be on the policy board. So there's the policy board and the technical advisory committee. The policy board kind of drives the funding decisions. Um, and, and essentially, if, if the municipalities and the borough um, can, get, uh, can get organized and, um, and understand uh, kind of, kind of what, what's expected and where there is some, some, uh, some leeway, uh, especially in terms of, of the makeup, because the makeup itself is, is pretty flexible. Um, I can't speak directly to, to AMATS's makeup. I think it has something to do directly with um, the policy board is tied to the, the assembly itself. And then, and then FMATS is switching over to um, to a nonprofit model. So there's a lot of flexibility regarding the makeup itself of the MPO. Um, and I think the, the sooner that um, our, our borough, the, the assembly members, and then uh, and then the cities and their their city council members um, uh, kind of understand what what are the parameters, um, the sooner they can have um, uh, meaningful and uh, meaningful input uh, to inform the, the outcome. Okay, so I, I'm sorry, just on a basic level, because I I'd thought of. I thought Matsu was developing a kind of AMATS, but it's a statewide purporting to affect all metropolitan transit. So the, the, the Metropolitan Planning Organization is a federally mandated organization right. that's tripped when you reach a certain population threshold. Right. So after the next census, that'll happen. Um, 
Uh, but no, but in, in terms of, um, it, it won't be the Matsu Borough as as the MPO. It'll be whatever. Um, it'll be what, whatever representative. So there will, there will be probably uh, DOT, DEC. Well, sure, on our mats it has that too. But it, it, it is roughly that. It may have a different configuration. F mats will be different. But it'll um, be it, your mats. Your yes. Yeah, so so prop, prop, um, I, I can't say for sure. Probably it's it's unlikely that it'll be the entirety of the Matsu Borough boundary. It'll be um, whatever. Uh, the, I guess you would call it the core areas, so probably Palmer to Wasilla and down uh, part of uh, right. KGB Road. Okay. Who, did, who did I, uh, John, did you want in? Wait, I, sort of, I guess you got the gist of it, because ours is run by the policy committee and has two assembly members, the mayor, someone from DOT, and someone from right. the State Department of Health on it. And then, of course, there's a committee, technical advisory committee, with about 20 professional engineers and transportation people. Jamie, I think, is on there. Uh, but I, I think there is, once you have two that are adjacent, which ours would be, that um, you are required to coordinate to some extent. So things like these buses, we would be required to say, how do our two systems match? So it really creates that framework. But I want to see, there was a woman, a planner, that was coming to our policy committee meeting. And I think our technical advisory committees, too, is pretty impressive. A lot of driving for that. And, and I believe she left. So are we still on track, though? Or I guess, where are you in forming an MPO? He said she'll, the, he'll pick up where she left off. So, so essentially, I mean, we have this informal arrangement, but it's because there hasn't really been the structure. We had our AMATs. You guys didn't have a, a formal structure. And as you said, when they're next door to each other, which has never been the case yet, but will now, we are required to cooperate. I guess the Fed's telling us you have to cooperate is great. Why didn't we do it before, before they told us to? But um, I guess we were trying to. Uh, Mr. Sykes. No one else yet. Okay. I, I am not an expert in this area, but I've been involved in some of the preliminaries. We actually got involved with a grant to do pre-MPO preparation because we knew that we were going to have to do it anyway. And so um, let's get to the real issue, the money. Um, we don't get any money until the census is certified mm -hmm. and we actually become an MPO. And so that's you know, a couple of years off. And so I think that we should um, not hesitate to work on the issues at hand, but I think that the actual organization is a ways off. And uh, that's why I wanted to say that. Okay, further transportation. Uh, were there road specific stuff, uh, Senator Dyson? Yeah. In the Matsu Borough, do you have uh, issues with uh, which roads are maintained and cleared by the Department of Transportation? Uh, we do, and yes, do. ours, have, they're vestiges of when the borough and the city were uh, combined, and, but they're irrational. And uh, several brighter people than me have worked at trying to resolve it. Uh, is that an issue for you? And it, it appears to me to rationalize in that whole thing, everybody wins, but it's a bureaucratic mess and some labor contracts issues to keep us from doing it. But I appreciate you, you telling us what's going on with you guys. Um, so, so yes, we have um, similar experience and um, similar challenges. And, um, and we have been trying I've been there eight years, been trying to kind of work through this. But right now, the past couple of years, is any time we try to, to work with them to get an advancement, essentially they want to turn over all the maintenance, all the future responsibility on the borough and the liability. And no funding stream. And, and, and no funding stream. And that is, and I, I would like to think we're, we're very cooperative, we want to do. Our problem is, when you do business with the state, we find, and there's funding for one or two years or three years, they can cut it off and then you're stuck holding the bag. And that's our challenge. And so we had an issue where they're redoing um, the Glen Highway um, between the fairgrounds and the interchange um, with, the, with the Parks Highway. And so they want to put in a, a traffic light there, um, but they want us to take entire maintenance and operation, <coughs> operation for that. What we were able to do is there was five gravel companies right there. We, we cut a deal with the gravel companies to pick up 
um, 75% of the cost. We picked up 25% of the cost to move forward on that um, to get that traffic like in there. But everything we do, they are looking to shed their responsibility. And, um, and all our road system is not the Matsu Burroughs road system. We, we don't have the powers because we're second class borough. It's in road service areas. So, and some of them are pretty small. So to, to have a road service area and they now take on a state responsibility, it may be a 15, 20, 30% tax increase to those payers. Um, so we've not been, um, we've not been satisfied. Um, and we're hoping with the new administration and the change, there's another opportunity. One thing we found about this administration is they're talking to us, where they're in the past, um, they just set down edicts. Uh, have, uh, we're facing that state uh, either just uh, not doing services they had before and we either backfill or it doesn't happen or, um, or reducing it or trying to get us to voluntarily take it. The, the analogy that we're facing right now, though, a lot of different areas in police and prosecution in a lot of areas, is Jewel Lake Road there, which is a state road, they're redesigning without lighting. Um, and it needs lighting. And, and they're like, well, if you want lighting, put it on. And so it's, it's uh, we want the services, just as you uh, wanted the traffic light, but we're not willing to backfill every time uh, they don't. And how we, how we confront that, we're struggling with. Now, there was a, a little bit of it before, but I worry there's a lot coming. Uh, Mr. Weddle. A couple of quick ones to follow up. So you said that there's a, the state's putting in a traffic signal, there's up, you know, there's maintenance and so on, and you have a deal with local businesses there to cover the operate, help cover the operating costs? Well, that's pretty wow. impressive, good on you. Um, 75, 25. Your employee behind you is, uh, is shaking his head no. The gentleman behind uh, you. Uh, the attorney, attorney again. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the attorney. It's not really. It, John duck down. You could say it's a deal, but <laughs> the the property owners consented to being in a Go differential ahead, tax zone of the service area, so yeah. they're going to get a differential tax bill. Yeah. So they voluntarily said, "Go ahead and tax us more." Um, in the future, they may have a problem if they come back and say, "Wait, we don't want you to tax us anymore because um, we already have the power to tax." So it. it it, it was a partnership that grew out of it, but the mechanism is simply a differential tax zone in the service area for limited to the purpose of signal crossing and railroad crossing. I understood it before the lawyer explained it, but, um, <laughs> but now I don't. The, um, no, th <laughs> so thank you, sir. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, so confusing. <laughs> further transportation related comments while well, we have had, Jamie? Um, thank oh, you, sure. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, okay. I, even though we think that it's unlikely rail commuter rail is going nowhere, the door has been left open, and I believe that all five mayors recently received a letter from the railroad saying, you know, we, we'd like to do this. All we need is money, but that's not a news story. Um, but three years ago, they offered to do a pilot train in the winter with the extra cars that they had, and there, were, there was no demand for money at that time. And so I think that at least keeping the um, discussion of a pilot project going is worthwhile because even if we just have a pilot project for a few months during the winter, I think it will eliminate a lot of the other um, unthought of problems like what do you do with people when they get here in Anchorage and, and other things that we haven't talked about. So I, I just would hope that we don't just forget about it because we don't see it on the governor's budget. Um, as I said, I asked for some of the people to come in and then they're going to go back and do your job. So I'd like to let Jamie Acton of Transportation go when we're done with this, but further transportation. Um, actually, I, I did want to follow up on the, the train concept as we think of this beyond just getting people into Anchorage, we should include the concept of getting people to and from the International Airport, um, mm -hmm. both for tourism purposes for the Matsu Valley, I would think, and also for um, the fact that our, our airport operates at such odd hours um, that I think we should include that in our conversation, not just in the Anchorage, but to the airport and out. Absolutely right, and we're redesigning our, our parking authority downtown is redesigning our, our downtown transit center. So you'd, you'd hope and think that as we talk about where do you drop people off, how does that connect with uh, the rest of town or getting places or getting to work 
often downtown but not always how that works into it and, and coordinates mr peters thank you mr chairman um so <clears throat> my question goes back to the valley mover um is is the valley mover a privately owned company a private public partnership and um what how's their ridership with those buses that are coming to anchorage uh, 14 or passing by eagle river 14 times a day are they full are they empty half full does anybody know so um i texted jennifer too before i came to this meeting saying are you going to be here uh, she's the executive director of valley transit uh, i cannot speak to their ridership currently i haven't had an update we actually have a meeting scheduled on monday to get together and chat and touch base uh, but you know they're a private nonprofit that is uh, highly uh, funded through the state transit office and so they play by a lot of the same rules that we do but um, you know I know that over the years as they were asked to consolidate uh, providers out in the valley they were able to step up and, and provide that service so um, hopefully Jennifer at some point can participate in these conversations as well and uh, like I said we're going to be meeting on Monday to, to touch base again so you said funded by the state is that using federal money yes uh, 5311 dollars uh, that Anchorage is not eligible for Ben did you want to say something just a few I can't speak to their demand response, but their their Anchorage route uh, has over fifty thousand rides every year. Um, and uh, Lisa, just park it between John and Ted, and we'll avoid that. Um, a just a quick comment, Mr. Constant. Yes. For the record, note that the mayor's chief of staff, Ona Bras, is in attendance. All right, um, Ona is noted. The, um, <laughs> Further questions of Ms. Acton or general transportation issues? As I said, I want to, as much as possible, identify things we want to work on and ways we're going to do it, and then we'll get to, when we have extra time, actually solving all these problems. But I don't know if we'll get it today. Thank you for being here and letting us put you on the spot. Um, transportation road comments? You sort of branched us into snowplow and how that's done. Do you does the Matsu have a Torah with the state to share snowplowing, or because you do it through service areas so much, it's a different relationship? Yeah. Well, either John or. Um, they take care of theirs. We take care of um, take care of ours. It's uh, completely separate. Yeah. Um, and it's been been part separate. of the issue. I believe it was three years ago. Um, Senator Hughes floated the idea that um, because we think because we essentially um, we don't do it. We have pro um, private contractors who do all that. who do a, a great job. Um, they're usually better and quicker than the state getting out there for the majority of the roads. So Senator Hughes wanted to know if we'd be willing to take over that. Um, they'd give us a road, the state would provide funding, and then we would manage it. And it all came down to, yeah, it's great for one year, but what are you gonna do year two, three, or four? Um, and how do we handle that if the state you know, walks away? I mean, we both have issues where we have partnerships, we do something on their behalf, they're supposed to fund it, and then they didn't fund it, and we're end up holding the bag. So that's our big concern. Right, that's a, that's a, a good, possible management situation but it relies on everybody paying the bills they agreed to and if they don't then it 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 um, it's even more problematic than just them doing it and maybe not doing it as well as you like people know who to complain to if you assume it and then you're not getting the payment exactly it's our problem now and we're the bad guys yeah okay mr weddleton i think we do it a little different here is we trade lane miles so it's not really a funding thing so if they quit doing the trade okay well they have theirs left so it doesn't leave us quite as vulnerable as you sound like you are correct <laughs> <laughs> well well said succinctly said um move on to, from transportation i know we could spend all all couple hours on this mr weddleton again i guess this is a closing i, I hope they continue to 
study the MPO and maybe get a jump on it because if it's really two years or so before you would be officially one, well, then it can be two or three years before you get your first tip. And you'd want to get all that lined up and ready to go so when you're an MPO, we're ready and we know what the um, common things we can work on together are. And if you um, maybe you lose the 5311 funds or something because you're um, now an MPO, plan on that. But, because these things can take forever. You get a simple project when you get into AMATS or MPO funding, it can be five years before you get a small project. Appreciate that. Great, yeah, absolutely. Ms. Acton. I just got permission uh, from Ben. So the borough actually did a MPO self-assessment and I wanted to make sure that it was disseminated and available to all of you. Um, I think it was finalized in 2015, but um, I will get Ms. Jones an electronic copy and she'll get it disseminated and, and uh, it available for, for the body. So we can all read it, <laughs> study it, respond to it. No. Um, 51 pages, that'll be your homework. Um, so. Um, we have our new AWU um, uh, person. I'll get to you uh, shortly. We also have Mr. Constant who has to leave uh, soon. So I wanted to prioritize port issues with Mr. Constant and then water and sewage issues with you. Mr. Constant, why don't you introduce that? Thank you. So somebody out here, I don't remember who exactly mentioned they wanted to talk about the impacts of the port project on goods coming through. And so I just want to engage that conversation now and make some brief announcements when we get there. So I'll hand the mic over for questions first. Pass it down. You know, uh, I, I'm really just seeking to uh, to learn the impacts of the port on the, the economics of the state as well as uh, you know, the economics to the, uh, to the uh, person who buys groceries every, every day. Right. So, um, with two billion dollar price tag, uh, that's a lot of money, uh, and, uh, and obviously that's going to have some impact. So, um, I can respond. Yeah, thank you. So, as many of you have probably read, uh, recently in the last week and a half, there was an announcement of a large scale increase in the cost of the proposed port modernization project and uh, that shocking uh, moment raised the awareness of several of us that we have to start taking real close look at what's happening and yes everybody who has groceries that lives on the rail or road belt pays for that port and pays for the tariff that comes for the goods and services that come over the port and so what we've started to do, Mr. Croft and I, and Mr. Training, are we're convening a first substantial meeting of the various port users and engineers. And it's intended to be on the 20th of this month, February, from noon to three, at our assembly conference room, in which we will host the port engineers that operate in the community to do a peer review of the project as it stands at this time. And then we will also bring in the customers of the port to present to us what's on the table and if it meets their needs or if it exceeds their needs or if we can tailor that project. And then the goal is to have a kind of a value engineering approach to how do we right size this project so it doesn't cause massive harm in the economy. And so that's the theory that we're operating under. The, the talk on the 20th won't be about the tariff per se, because that's going to be a whole other item that comes before us officially. But on about the 20th of February, we're going to begin a deep dive into the issue of the port and look at how we do a better job. So that's, the, that's where we stand today. Yeah, and um, we would like to cooperate on this and frankly would like your assistance on um, uh, how we get the resources for what we believe is a statewide port, port of, we renamed it, but it, it's more accurately the Port of Alaska. It services not just Anchorage. We're managing it, but its, it's impacts are gonna be felt all through the rail belt in the state. Um, and so on, uh, with all the other issues you've got, we would like your assistance on doing that. Uh, Mr. Leonard. They don't think so. Oh, I guess <laughs> oh, okay. Double my uh, 
one of the things, uh, and I know you're in the middle of this issue. Uh, I was at Ada oh, about six or seven years ago. We were talking about ports with the Port Authority and the issue of the whole port system that would be interesting to discuss, whereas uh, Matsu Valley or the borough is still working on its port, which would be more of an export port and for, uh, you know, natural resources. So down the line, it would still be interesting of how we do work with Anchorage and with the Kenai Borough on the whole port system and, uh, you know, how Anchorage is the most important import. But as we look at uh, developing our natural resources, you know, we're still looking at, is it still, John, around $125 million for the rail? So anyway, I think it's, the, as we go forward, we have our own port issues with uh, repairing uh, reports of uh, ports, so we understand that, but the full port system of the state and uh, ways that we could work together on that. Yeah, there are two big port issues. We, we each have one, and so we can work together on both of them. Yeah, what this gentleman just said is uh, principled, thoughtful, and uh, brilliant, and almost unattainable. <laughs> 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 and uh, I investigated this some, and there's several ports around the country who have done that, a regional port authority. So I suggested we do that here in South Central. Seward's got a big port, but handles lots of, of uh, uh, commodities. Whittier has a marvelous ice-free deep water port, and so on and so forth. And so uh, these decisions about port development ought to depend upon the transportation links in and out of it, the, uh, how good a port it is. Ours is one of the worst around, and both because of tides and silting and, and so on. And the Corps of Engineers spends upwards of 15, $15 million a year dredging our port. And, and that's, a, that's a problem. What I found out was none of the port authorities, and at that time none of the communities were at all interested in looking at the greater good and the more efficiency and which ports were able to it and we're not willing to down, lay down any of their private interests to, to working together. <coughs> and sadly, uh, so on. It's, it's so rational. Uh, it says something about human nature. Or, or accumulated governmental and other entities that it's too rational to implement? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mr. Sykes? <laughs> Just to follow on that thought, um, I, I think the main aspect of a port authority is, is that, uh, at least as far as Forgiveness is concerned, somebody has to make some money. And right now, I don't think any of them are. I don't know, Kenai might be a little bit more flush than, than the others. But um, in terms of cooperation with, I know that your port repair, if there is something that uh, that our port can help do, whether it's staging material or whatever it is for your repairs, uh, we're, we certainly want to support your effort because we recognize that we both have ports and are going to be very different, but if there's something that we can't do, uh, we're, we're certainly welcome to talk about it. Appreciate it. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. What? yeah so, Mr. Mayfield, follow up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, actually, uh, I'd like to echo Mr. Sykes' uh, comments. Uh, is there going to be any downtime with with the port? Um, is this a modernization pro uh, project, or is it a repair, renovation? Um, uh, is there going to be downtime where we may uh, have an opportunity to assist uh, Anchorage in uh, supplies, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, it started as a modernization and probably too big. We're trying to scale it back to just repairing what we need to do. But Ms. Brass would like to speak. 
through the chairs? Do we have multiple you, chairs? You, I uh, guess so. You I would like to nice echo time. Mr. Dyson and Mr. Leonard's uh, and Mr. Sykes' effort towards uh, collaboration. We're absolutely open to that conversation. So we can pick that up uh, as soon as this meeting ends, if you are so inclined. The port project, as it is currently proposed and as we would like to keep it, uh, regardless of how much value engineering occurs, would include no downtime. That it is phased specifically so that we can keep the ships coming in and out and the petroleum cement terminal and just constantly in operation because we know that stopping that uh, supply chain is a big problem for the entire state. And if fifty million dollars of engineering can't work that out, then we're in big trouble. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I'd say uh, a couple years ago, um, I spent a, a little bit of time uh, working with uh, the port and went to some of their commission meetings and that kind of thing. And I have long advocated they stop using the term modernization because it sort of obscures what we're doing which is if you go down there, I know Mr. Croft and I, when we first got in the assembly, had a chance to go down there and like put your thumb through the piling. I, I mean, we, we're talking about critical repairs and had that earthquake gone on much longer, we could have seen liquefaction that would have wiped out that port. I mean, we have we have drone footage that we saw there are major cracks in the earth in that area. It's also the case that what Merad built for us is not just useless, it's actually actively damaging the port. So we have to spend millions of dollars, tens, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars undoing the damage that Merad did and we're currently in litigation with them to hopefully get some funding for that. We'll see how that sh shakes out. And then we have to do what is really, again, critical repairs. So I haven't been able to find a good synonym, that, or, or not a synonym, but another term that captures what we're really doing. But it's not like, we're not going for, you know, high-tech, fancy, port of the future modernization. We're going for, we have this critical piece of infrastructure that's 75 years old that needs to be replaced. Now, we, last year, the year before, when I, um, uh, you know, we, we talked about with the administration, and we, you know, our, our only major capital request to the state was that they help us repair the port. Um, and they did give us some money, although nowhere near the amount we needed. And we talked to them about doing a general obligation bond, which I'm sure you guys heard about. Um, we got no traction in the state, in part because some people from Anchorage were going down there and actively campaigning against it. And so what that leads us with, leaves us with, is the tariff, basically. That, that the way we're going to fund a lot of this likely is going to be uh, through increasing the cost of goods along the rail belt. And there really isn't a lot of other mechanisms where we can raise that kind of money. And what Mr. Constant is talking about is absolutely necessary. We have to try to come down from a $2 billion number if we can, but even if it's only a billion <laughs> or 800 million, that's far more than we as a city of Anchorage on our own can bond for. Um, so we either need the state to step up, which they show no indication that they're going to do, uh, or we're going to have to use the tariffs. And just one additional layer to that. I believe that when we come to a point where we have the most efficient project that can be found and Anchorage comes forward with some skin in the game and we propose a reasonable increased tariff, not the mega increase, then the state will come forward with funding to do their part. But they, these are all a bunch of ifs and we are prepared to do what we have to do to take care of that port, which might include a substantial cost of goods across the state of Alaska. And so we hope that that's not the path and we're going to dive deep into this starting on the 20th and we invite you to come and sit in the room and uh, have I'm a few minutes to comment. Thank you. So that's what's happening with our port. What's happening with your port? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's an easy discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. That actually, that actually is a pretty easy discussion. Uh, we, we, have, uh, we have opportunities that we are exploring, but I think that that is probably uh, the best light that we can uh, place on it right now. Uh, the, uh, we've always been in search of an anchor tenant, and we have not yet found them, uh, but I do believe that uh, John could probably uh, uh, speak to this a little more uh, uh, fluently in that uh, uh, we have potential. And I guess specifically because I was reading about the possibilities of gas out of there, the, the competition on the gas export. So essentially, you know, with our port, um, until we get rail service there um, as a resource development port, which we believe that we are, it makes it very difficult 
Um, we have worked in timber. We have worked with the, the REIs, worked at the Westpacs as far as natural gas out of Cook Inlet. Our problem is we're so dependent on the world economy, what they're going to pay for goods and services, and that rail is going to be a key piece to drive down transportation costs. Um, so essentially, you know, we're, let's be honest, we're trying to hit a grand slam with nobody on base. And that's, that's a struggle that, um, that we always have. Um, we get real close to timber um, and have a, a good uh, plan in place, and then um, they do the tariff with the, with the timber going to China, and that, and that kills that opportunity. So, but the rail is, is really key. We're trying to do it without the rail, and it's really skinny opportunities. We'd really like, and we constantly say this, we do not believe we're in any way competition with the Port of Alaska. We think you're a separate port. We're trying to develop our economy for resource development and taking those resources and make it um, um, added, such as chips into, um, into pellets, um, as, as opposed to those type of things. So I think it's a natural partnership if we can get together and do that. I think because we're asking for 125 million, you guys need somewhere, not as much as 2.5 billion, but 2 billion, that sort of thing. We're in competition for state money and I think that's, that's really been our challenge. It makes a ton of sense to do a board authority. I just don't know politically that you can. Um, but that's the way of going. And our problem is, from my view as manager, is when we're doing business, we're working A to A, which is the bitumen out of Alberta. And we're making a lot of progress. However, as a manager, any documents we have is public record. And business folks do not like every single detail picked apart before they're negotiated. So if you have um, a private organization operating like a normal business where you can negotiate and then reveal the final product to be approved by the entities, um, that's probably the most best chance for us to be successful. You know, in some ways we have flip, flip of the coin problems. One of our difficulties, and Mr. Dunbar summarized it, Mr. Constant, we're primarily an import port. All, most other big ports have import and export, and in at least some balance. And we just have almost no export balance to that. We collect containers, and we, you know, we, we bring in, and we almost never bring out. You're looking at for an export opportunity. Um, that, is, that is correct. Um, we think there's great potential if it can be pulled off to um, with the A to A company to have the Canadian Alaska rail line combined because of um, the ports on the west coast, lower 48. Um, it takes so long to get in there. You can actually get, there's been studies, you could get goods and services through Ala to Alaska all the way to Chicago a week or two quicker than you can going through the west coast normal pattern just because of the jam of the traffic. Does a port authority solve the disclosure problem you were talking about or not? Does it make it I, easier to do deals? I, I want to say this, and, and I just want to tell my somebody, I, I love you and I appreciate my job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sometimes best decision, um, business decisions are not being able to make as a, as a political decision. And we, you know, each of my assembly members serve 15,000 people. They have opinions. And sometimes you have to make strong business decisions for business decisions. And we have to do that through the lens of we work 100% for the public all the time. Not to say it's going to be bad, but it's, it's just a different, uh, a different makeup on how you get these things done. Okay, got that. And good, good comment to say. Um, but, but does a port authority partially solve that problem or not really? It's still a governmental entity and still has disclosure I think it's I think it solves a lot of that. You can do more deals and then release them than you can uh, operating. Well, the deals are still going to need approval if you, if you need approval from the entities, but it's going to be the final, completed, negotiated deal. As opposed to every step. Every, every, every step is, is open up. I gotcha. mean, I, I've been told that there there is lunch back there. I'd like to keep working as long as people can. So if you want to, you can grab a sandwich and come back, and we'll keep it going. Be quiet as you do it. Uh, Mr. Dyson. Yeah, so whoever it was <coughs> said that uh, our economy is dependent on prices, come on, our economy is dependent on commodity prices we can't control. And uh, uh, one of the things that's happened, we're victims of perfect storms. 
uh, Alaska has immense low sulfur coal, and that market has gone in the ditch. Whatever you think about clean toll technology and so on, that's the thing in the ditch. That terribly wounded the railroad. Those guys are on the ropes uh, uh, because of that. Uh, I was going to say something else insightful. Yeah, yeah, I had another brilliant comment too, and I can't bring it back. We'll bring it back together. Um, Mr. Constant, yeah, if you bring it back. So, one thing that you said, Mr. Moosey, was uh, that we have maybe 2.5, but probably $2 billion project, right? So, 5% of the project doubled in cost from 100 to 200 plus million dollars. So, my greatest fear is not that we're looking at the $2 billion port, but we're looking at a project that incrementally leapfrogs itself and becomes a much greater than problem, right? And that is if you, most of you probably have spent time and work with government construction projects, they have a tendency to do that. And so our really due diligence duty right now is to get in front of that curve and stop it now. And so that's our big picture challenge in the next couple of years is stop es exponential growth of cost. I have Mr. Sexack, but I remembered mine. Have you remembered yours yet? Yeah. Well, you didn't get to do it. I just, I just, I just wanted to know if you did it. You can World hold scrap it. Scrap prices have gone down, and nothing is going out, uh, and it helps hurts our recycling. And it used to be an export we had on the back. <laughs> I didn't mean you had to do it now, but um, and now I forgot my no. It is that we, you know, we've had a similar situation. You described five different ports who can't get together in a port authority and work together because of their own entity. Or in this case, did. We have five utilities that haven't in, uh, been able to uh, do a rail belt utility before, and I know there are issues on that. We we finally solved ours with MLMP and Jugach, and maybe that's the step to either greater cooperation or uh, some sort of combined in, uh, entity along the rail belt that, that I continue to think has made sense. So sometimes you can make these things go completely. Sometimes you can make them go by just two of the entities uh, working better together and leading the way. Um, is there significant dredging on your required on your port? It's mainly it. Yeah, I thought not. Okay, Mr. Sykes. Um, I just wanted to just kind of lay out the, the place in history that I think our port is. Is you now Seward didn't have a lot going on for many years until they got the Sun Eel contract, and that really put them on the map. But you know, they they had an informal process where anybody who cared about the port, the possibility of more uh, development. Um, they met once a month, and anybody that had a clue, they, they finally found somebody, and it was Sunny on. We're kind of in that process now. I, I did succeed in getting the uh, mission statement of our port to include a commodities survey of what potential commodities are out there, because at some point somebody's going to have to put some cash on the line uh, to do it. And uh, so I just, uh, we're just, we're just new. The two, the two things that are uh, possible, the. Uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is expected to uh, finalize a license for the ASAP gas line, which may be significant because the AGDC line is in, in trouble, at least it's in transition now. But at least if that one is built and it, and it comes to Houston, which is very close to our port, it wouldn't take much to put a spur for export gas. So that would be that would uh, be the impetus to get the rail line done as well. So um, there are. There's more interest in the port than there has been in quite some time, but we're just in this historical chicken and egg kind of thing. All right, having solved the issues of our two ports, um, I'd like, did you have, no. Um, I just want to say thank you and goodbye. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I hate to run early, but I have to get back to work, so. Um, Mark, give me, say your name one more time. That's Mark Corsentino. Corsentino. Uh, so uh, our, our new director at AWU, we were just going to move, um, I'm not sure if there are specific questions, but appreciate having you here, to sort of, um, and Jim, you brought it up, what do we, what septic or other water and sewage issues should we discuss here between the two? I, I guess, is there a plan to close or change the way we receive some of the valley septic in our system? Uh, we have two source or two places now. Yeah, so we the, the utility has two septic stations in the municipality right now. One's at Turpin and one's at King Street. Uh, 
for efficiency sakes, we want to uh, consolidate to one. We're evaluating that process right now, and there's a lot of reasons for doing so, which we could probably discuss another time because it's a dirty subject. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you were waiting on that. The, um, so I take it the, the, the Matsuburo concern is if it's a consolidation that consolidates at King Street, that's a lot longer for your folks. Well, the, we're, the, the borough is also, we've recorded, we've been going, the borough has a wastewater receptors advisory board, which we participated in for a while as well. And, and their focus right now, as my understanding, is what leachate, with the next focus being on septage. So we do, we will stay, we, we will continue to take their septage, uh, but if it does, if it's, remember, we're, we're a municipal entity and we're obligated to the rate payers. And so they do, they pay rates, but it's always, it's a hard thing to, this is a complicated issue in the long term. The bottom line is there would be concerns, which we understand, but the reality is we have to do what's in the best interest of all our customers and um, we keep costs down, and that's one of the ways we can do that. So it's not a set in stone thing, but it's certainly something we're taking a close look at and we're uh, working with. And they're, the, the borough's aware of it, but um, we're always, as always, open to suggestions and concerns. So what is the status before they, so, so they can know, what is the status of the discussions or process on consolidating those? A done deal, just starting in between? No, we're, we're, we're in the middle of design. We're collecting data as well. Um, uh, we're trying to figure out the best location for a single facility for cost-saving measures. And again, what well, we'd like to do, how can they participate in, I know your, your primary responsibility is to the ratepayers, but in what way can they know and participate in that process? We continually provide updates at the SEPTIS advisory committees, and that's probably the best approach thus far. And then is there any increase in the charge being contemplated? There likely will be, yes. We'll keep them informed of that as well, and you guys can register your opinion on it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, you, we can come to your assembly meeting, huh? <laughs> you know, three minutes. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, I just wanted to mention that um, sort of the higher view of this is we understand that the EPA, you, you have primary plus treatment, uh, which is not a very high level treatment that most other uh, municipalities that discharge uh, into the ocean have, and that's that's hanging over you guys' head. Um, we, uh, we don't have, the only obligation that we have legally is to deal with the leachate, which is the water in the landfill. That we have an obligation to treat that, and we are we have begun the process. We are actually doing a, a test of the uh, plant that's going to be built at the landfill. Uh, we are not obligated because we are a second class bro and we don't have powers over the septage. It is entirely privately run, and so the fact that you are taking the valley septage is great, but we know that that's not going to continue forever. So that's why we're looking into the waste of power, and uh, and and, and there appears to be very high interest in it. But we are not sure that we're going to make that to be efficient. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we did meet with uh, AWWU and Solid Waste Utilities here in Anchorage, and the idea of a, a joint waste of power project was broached. And so it's just in the preliminary discussions that. You're right, we have different interests, but they do sort of collide, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and I, I think that we have an interest in working them out. And, and Mark, what is the status of that? Um, how much longer can we do what we're doing in terms of discharge, or what are the timelines on that? That's the EPA's decision, mm. <laughs> so it's a, it's a big unknown. The reality is that, as Jim said it right, one of our driving factors is, is our uh, uh, primary permit, and we, have, we exceed our primary standards, but we're not secondary. And unless if the EPA ever pushed back on taking waste from outside the municipality of Anchorage, um, that's one thing that could suffer. And that's so there's really it's a, it's a there's no time gap from the EPA. There, the EPA has told us time and time again it's not a matter of if but when we go secondary. Now we've proven time and time again also that our treatment standards um, do do a very very good job of primary treatment because they exceed it and there's the impact is is not um, there's really no impact to the wildlife. Uh, through what we know all the agencies. So we've done a really good job with that. So we feel we're in a good position. However, the, some of those decisions are political and beyond our, our control. So you've got past me a little, probably other members are on top of it. But, so there's two issues right there. Is how long can we continue to do what we're doing? And one of the first things they might do is say, correct. don't accept stuff from other places at least. Oh, they, they could, correct. Okay, okay. And that would have a big trickle down or well, whatever it's a effect on you. Yeah. Uh, for, we actually are in our, we're also regulated by RCA and they in our tariff, we petitioned a long time ago to get them to, to treat us more like a, um, a 
we do not waste utility as well. Um, we do collect our waste, it's in our tariff, so we'd have to actually petition the RC to take that out if the EPA told us. So it's a complicated situation in regards to that. Okay, so we, we say to the EPA, we are kind of a, not... We are regulated by the other state to take it at this point in time. So we're kind of a regional authority. You should treat us as such. Yeah, right? yes. Okay, Mr. Mr. Dunbar. You know, this, this might be more appropriate for a later utility committee meeting, but just as a preview, what would the EPA's enforcement mechanism be? If they said, you need to go to secondary, and we said, well, we don't have the money to, I've heard it's many hundreds of millions of dollars to upgrade that plant. Uh, it's close right? to a billion. It's a yeah. billion dollars. Yeah. We don't have it. The state not's gonna get, not, is not going to give it to us. Is EPA going to shut down the only treatment plant no, in a no, major American a consent, city? A consent, a consent agree with fines, and the mayor gives a letter says you're going to get threatened with jail time. <laughs> That's okay. okay. So it's not a big that deal. Has, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that has happened before with uh, other bur uh, municipalities. San Diego lost their primary plant. Uh, there's a few others that have lost over time, and that's how it's happened. They give you like 20 to 30 years to fund it and do it, but it is a huge okay. impact on the cost, and um, it's a it's a real deal if it happens. But so it'll be uh, Mayor Burke Croft to go to jail. He's talking about my son. Yeah. Um, the. Um, Okay, so I want to make use of you and then let you go back to work. Further questions on water wastewater, water sewage uh, of Mark. Appreciate that. We're moving through issues. Thanks for coming. Um, I'll move any issue up that, that um, people may want to make sure we're at about a little under 1230. We have till 2, so we still have an hour and a half. Lunch is back there if people want to get it. Um, you guys did the tour on vote by mail. What's the status of your voting mechanisms, consideration of vote by mail? How can we help? All the all the borough people are now eating, so nobody. It's Mr. Sumner. Why don't you give us a report on that? No, I I don't, I don't know whether you guys are considering it or not. I don't know. I don't know consideration for that. We're moving our uh, election day to be the same as the state's on. You're moving from October to November. Yeah. yeah. Years. But, but they won't run your election. It'll just be side-by-side -side elections? Uh, well, we haven't really decided that right. yet. Um, maybe we could run the ballots on their machines the day after. Right. Or, uh, you know, we, we don't really have a solution for that yet. We are using the state's machines at this time. So Lonnie McKechnie, Matt Hi. Hi. Would be a good person. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Sorry. We are going to be using the state's equipment, the old equipment in the 2019 election. I will be in this year's budget sending money for, or requesting money from the assembly to buy our own equipment, hopefully to get on with the state. And at that point, I think it's gonna begin the assembly discussion on how we're moving forward with the election. So that is my plan as of right now. Yeah, appreciate it. The, um, we were nervous doing it, but thought it was the right way eventually. And um, we also, continue to be nervous or were nervous before about the status of those machines they're getting older and failing more and harder to find parts and I'm not sure the state has watched our process and been involved and we have coordinated with them I don't I don't know that they're any closer to, to a decision as well um, yeah Gretchen yeah sure uh, I do notice when I went into the other room and also over on the side that if we don't hold the microphone close to our mouths um, you cannot hear outside of this circle. And so for the sake of people who are on the, is, am I correct? Is it difficult for some folks? So I think we need to really hold the microphones up close um, and make sure that all of the other people in the room can hear. Okay, thanks. Um, you, I'm sorry, I know you're in, but you're also sorry. here. Um, education was something you Brought up, why don't, um, where did I always go? Oh, it's right there. Um, ask what you want, I'll grab a sandwich. Sure. Um, education has only been one of my top, top priorities, personally. Um, and with the, um, with the governor's announcement that there'll be some um, serious cutbacks in education with, uh, uh, and not meeting the promise of, of funding uh, from last year. I'm wondering if you share, share that concern, uh, since we both represent two of the major student populations in the state, and, um, and perhaps have a discussion as to what kind of input we may have on that. Uh, 
So I can definitely say uh, personally that I definitely share that concern. I've also heard, um, I got a good chance to talk to Dina Mitchell, who is, I believe, the vice president of the school board uh, and in Anchorage. And um, she has been talking with the legislators, and um, many of them feel like they don't want to go back on that promise that they made. And so the, the governor would have to uh, get approval from the legislature. So uh, what I'm more concerned about is what's going to come up in his next budget proposal. Right. Mr. Leonard would be our subject matter expert on that. Is him. Oh, okay, well, we're deferring to Mr. Lucy. Uh, Get the cheetahs off my fingers. <laughs> okay. um, we, we do not. Um, we have done, uh, done some studies, and I think percentage wise, um, Anchorage co contributes more uh, towards the schools. But we, and I think you're able to do that because you're commercial based. But the Matsu Valley homeowners, the residents, pay a higher percentage to the schools than any other place in the state. Um, so our, our ho homeowners are picking up um, percentage wise uh, more than anyone else per value of their homes. Um, one of the things that happened three years ago, I believe, is that um, right before um, I think our budget is supposed to start. Um, July 1st, the governor whacked us with $5.7 million. Um, he reneged on the school bond formula, and that's something we're, we're constantly concerned with. Um, but uh, my, my big push and, um, is that we went to our taxpayers and said, if you pay this, the state will pick up this to move forward on the, on the school facilities. And in good faith, they did that. And I have a, personally have a hard time on anybody saying, well, you know, this is what your vote was, um, but, but we don't care. And um, I think you have some similar concerns with when you take these out to your ballot. You know, you want to guarantee your, your citizens they vote, yes, this is how it's going to play out for you, um, as opposed to a bait, we thought it was pretty much a bait and switch. Um, they tried to do it, I think, the next year at a higher percentage, and then they backed off that. But um, I think probably you and um, us have the, the highest school reimbursement debt. And they did put a moratorium on new school buildings um, for five years. So we have been playing by those rules and understand those rules. Thank you. Still on education, people? Yeah, Mayor Cottle. So just one quick comment. I would like to see both assemblies um, combine their efforts, lift the five-year moratorium, <clears throat> and go back to the governor and say lift it for the affected schools on the earthquakes. Right. And that you know, and honor the fifty and honor the fifty fifty match and say, look, if, if, if Matt Sue can put up the fifty percent, the governor can put up the fifty percent for us, and then also for them, you know, for your Eagle River schools. I don't know why the two assemblies can't agree on that. I think they ought to lift the moratorium and go back and fix the schools. I mean that's outside what we, we all agreed upon, and there, there is funding available, and uh, I think if the state would pick up 50-50 of the match, I think we could all fix the schools that got damaged and do it right, because there's always going to be a concern as far as sending them kids back to them schools, and some of them kids will not go back to them schools, they're going to shift them to other schools. So, I think just in fairness, I think that's one thing that we all can have, I would hope, common ground on, that put the moratorium for a one-time fix on the schools. I'll just pass it to Mr. Dyson now. Another long-term issue, but very closely related. Uh, the limit on local contribution, I believe, was a misguided effort to have equity all around the state so that our two boroughs, which are relatively uh, financially capable, couldn't have better schools than everyone else. And that's a very flawed line of reasoning and so on. Plus, I think this is probably two of you all a little bit, but lots of Alaska's emotional, mental health, and 
physical illness issues come to us. A lot of our social problems and the costs that go with them are, are imported to us and uh, we're glad to be a service center for all kinds of things and so on and so forth. But we're disproportionately bearing the burden of problems we didn't cause and cost centers. And dealing with uh, developmentally disabled children, you know, the cost per student is disproportionate, orders of magnitude difference. And it would be, I would like us to think about both of us going to the legislature and saying, lift the local the limit on local contributions so we can do better by our kids particularly the special needs ones. careful what, careful what you ask for yeah, for real but We're but I, I said careful what you ask for but I, I get it I thought some of that mr. Dyson was federal requirements that is uh, in order to receive impact aid you can't have this much disparity but it may be just state rules I don't know well as usual you're right. I don't know. We can find out anyway. Yeah, yeah, but those are worthwhile doing. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Leonard, yeah. Senator Dyson is I got all these local We're one of the few states that, because we're still growing, that because of the foundation formula we lost was a million or two million dollars over the last you two years but in foundation for, uh, payments so uh, there has been the formulas even changed from when I was a business manager at a school district and, uh, it's antiquated and again it's the scary part is uh, watch out what you ask for because you don't know what type of formula will come forward, but the formula is an issue, and it's something that as the largest population centers or the municipality in the borough looking at that to ensure fairness in the formula. Um, are people needing a break, or you want to power through to two? We, we've had some food. I'd yeah? Like, I'd like, like, like just have one final comment on education. Um, I would uh, I would ask if there's any volunteers on the Anchorage Assembly who would like to work with me on uh, uh, something that we could propose as, as a joint resolution um, of both bodies uh, that would ask for restoration of the uh, of the promised funds of education as well as uh, perhaps a separate resolution uh, abolishing the moratorium. Uh, as Mayor Cottle has suggested. So if there are any volunteers who would like to do that, I'd, I'd be more than happy to uh, work with somebody uh, to that end. I'd, I'd be glad to work with you, and uh, I'm a short-timer on it, but we can get the language. I mean, it's either the full thing, which a lot of municipalities, and I think the Municipal League has asked for res restoration of that, but then uh, Mayor Cottle's right doing a narrower sphere on that to say for these earthquakes at you know, one time. And that both would be useful and maybe a vehicle to get get the whole thing done at some point to, to push us through. Federal payback. Federal involvement. Um, I'm interested. Yeah, okay. And Suzanne's going to be here for a long time. Me Mr. Too. Dunbar. Oh, and Mr. I, Dunbar. I, I have yeah, on that. that. Would you like to go to public safety next? Well, yeah, I actually, I want to ask. I, I don't want to step on Ms. LaFrance's uh, questions about public safety, um, but I just want to ask sort of a broad question to the Matsu Borough um, representatives here uh, about education and public safety and transportation and kind of on all of it but if you listen to the rhetoric of the, the governor uh, the new governor who comes from the Matsu Valley uh, was your state senator um, he's saying he's going to cut 1.6 billion dollars in state support and you know we've been working hard in, in anchors to try to make the city a little bit more financially self-sustaining you know it's one of the reasons we are selling mlmp it's why we passed the fuel tax to diversify our revenue streams it's why we're considering an alcohol tax and i'm curious if you were to see a drop of i don't know 20 30 20 or 30 percent state support for your borough i'm curious what you would do broadly speaking, but I'll talk specific, I think specifically about public safety too. I'm curious, curious about that because I know that you rely quite heavily on the state troopers. 
Who wants to take that? Well, I'll start with the real easy one. That's uh, public safety. Um, we're a second-class borough, and we don't have police powers. So, um, basically, the only cops we've got are um, City of Palmer, City of Wasilla, and um, troopers. So, um, we now have 107,000 people in the borough, approximately. 17,000 of those live in Palmer and Wasilla, within the city limits. So the other 90,000 are dependent on troopers, which don't have any larger of a force than Mayor Cottle has in Wasilla, about three dozen cops. So um, we're working on it. Um, Mr. Leonard and I have uh, try, uh, uh, are, are trying to <coughs> get our committee up and running on uh, public safety. We did take a question to the ballot, and I think it was like almost 60% of the people uh, voted for the ballot proposition, and it was not shall we have police powers, but shall we investigate all of the options and costs to do something. And some people suggested police service areas. There's been a, a suggestion of uh, uh, private uh, recruitment. There's been a suggestion uh, of the city of Palmer actually looked at expanding their, ser expanding their service area, um, and they decided not to do it. It costs money. Yep. And that's, uh, that's always at the bottom of it. Um, but I think we are making progress. We have uh, plenty of crime. I know that's a new thing, but um, uh, the problem is very serious. It was the number one problem um, that citizens identified. And um, so we're starting to work on it. And um, I hope that we can get something to the ballot soon. But uh, we're, we're off to a very slow start, that's all I can say at the moment. Mr. Weddleton. You know, if you haven't looked at uh, what Girdwood did, they relied on troopers because they're outside of our police service area. So they voted to give themselves police powers and tax themselves to hire the Whittier police. So I mean, that's also um, maybe a route to go. You would hire the Palmer police or something like that. And it has uh, worked beautifully for Girdwood. They're getting better service than they did with the troopers. But it's not at the super high level that the um, Anchorage Police Department would, would give them. Yeah, mistakes. Um, I don't. I don't know if it was the Senator Dyson or somebody else that raised the issue, but the service areas that we have, we have fairly populated service areas. Of course, the cities are most dense, and the areas around the cities are less dense. And then we have the outlying areas, and whether it's emergency services or public safety or anything else, schools. It's um, an area-wide service as we have for emergency services right now. It's how do you how do you make that service work so that it, it serves, you know, it's an equal tax on everybody. And uh, it's very complicated, but we know that Anchorage went through this very same thing years ago, and it was a struggle, um, but we're, we're, we're going through it right now. Um, more on public safety. Yeah, Mr. Dyson, and then we'll move. I just, think. Just a small issue, but thanks to the Batsu Borough for joining with us on reporting stuff that shows up in talk shows. And uh, yeah, as soon as that the word got out that all the Anchorage talk shops were completing, co co uh, cooperating with the cops, then and then there was a bloom in the talk shop <laughs> in the valley. And hey, we're open for business. Right? <laughs> Sorry? We're open for business, friend. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, free enterprise. <laughs> but thank you for doing that. I suspect we all gain from it. It's a great example, right, of how we're interconnected even if we didn't intend it or want to be and what we do affects each other and we can either, yeah, help with it or not and I'm gl glad you guys did. Um, I, the issues that I had left were um, bears, wildfire, fish, trash and recycling, homelessness, semi-rural to rural areas and interchange, Earthquake, though, have we touched that enough because of education, or are there other earthquake issues you want to talk about? Yeah. Um, just, just a question, because we had, um, just for how you are going to handle it moving forward, we had a $25 million earthquake insurance policy. That's going to help us with schools. Some question is, is, is the federal government 
and um, through FEMA and the state going to come in and make you and your earthquake damage to your schools and municipal buildings whole. And just want to kind of get the assembly's thoughts um, on that because that's a question because we know uh, I'm not going to get it as cheap next year as I did this year. Uh, I'll, I'll ask Ms. Browse in a second, but at the information that at least as I understood it was we were going to apply and that a lot of those, maybe most, maybe all of that money was going to be reimbursed. The direct expenses for the impacts on us governmentally and the things we reached out to do. Um, yeah, we were just talking about state promise of debt reimbursement, so I don't know what kind of promise that is, but that at least there's an expectation that a fair amount or a lot of it will be. I'm sorry to um, set you up on that, Ms. Browse, but the question was from the borough manager. Um, well, first of all, he said they have a $25 million earthquake insurance policy. I, I don't know whether, I'm curious whether we did or do, and how much of the impacts, both capital and direct operating, do we expect to be reimbursed by the state or the feds? To the chairman, I don't know the answer to those questions. Safer, <laughs> yeah. We'll get, we'll get back to you. <laughs> okay. So how does that if, if, impact your future decisions on whether you buy insurance or not? I need to connect with our risk manager in order to know the answer to that, but I can check with her. Yeah, interesting. Um, close earthquake, Mr. Peterson. <laughs> I know. Mr. Dyson, I thought of ours. you you got to have a second I'll, I'll, to... I'll have to wait a minute. <laughs> okay, good. It'll come back to you. It did to us. Bears. How about bears? It's a it's a topic I feel like we can knock off. This year. It's yeah. right. Good season this year. Well, that's bears are very, very popular in Anchorage, and they are so popular that neighborhoods rotate, so once a week they put out green containers full of food to attract them. <laughs> <laughs> and there's some crazies out there who think that's a bad idea. So um, we are looking at some new rules that would require in some areas that you'd have to have the bear cards and we have much higher fines if you're feeding the bears, et cetera, and so on. It'd be a lot simpler if you could just catch them and ship them to you. I don't know. What are you guys doing with bears? How do you handle the trash bear interchange? <laughs> I like to have both of them. Um, I really don't think we have a bear problem we in don't. Valley. We like to knock over moose of our cars, but we certainly don't. <laughs> We don't have very few issues um, with bears. Um, I've lived there eight years and I've not seen a bear in the Matsu Valley. You got the small of shoe. Shovel, <laughs> shut up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were good at it. <laughs> well, this guy's got a back hole. <laughs> it does seem odd with you having a more, much more rural character that it would be more of a problem with us. I don't know, I guess I'll ask why that would be, but I, nobody has any brilliant idea why that is so. Mr. Sykes and then Mr. Dunbar. Well, I, I live at the very end of the road, uh, at one extreme edge of the borough, and um, there are plenty of bears. Uh, we have both brown and black, but they don't like our smell, they don't like being around us, and they just don't have a reason to come because we do do a compost pile, and I did keep a porcupine alive one winter because she went, went into the compost pile every day. But um, I usually don't see the bears occasionally, um, but most people try to avoid putting stuff up that's an attractant, and I think that because there are quite a few bears, people are just more used to them and try and discourage their, their use. These guys were suggesting it's because we're dense in Anchorage. I, I, I think, no, 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 no. I think no, no. he meant it to be <laughs> population <laughs> density, but I wasn't sure. So, um, if, Did it come to you? It did. Then let's take Mr. Peterson because he actually remembered what he was going to talk about. And then we'll start. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I actually happened to uh, catch a little uh, blurb on the news last night. Uh, there's a congressional committee uh, in the House back in D.C. 
uh, that's working on um, a compromise proposal to keep the government open uh, in, when the three weeks are up or whenever that is in the middle of February. And they were one of the things they were talking about discussing it today was funding the FEMA. And so uh, if that uh, committee is successful in coming up with an agreement that doesn't get vetoed, then the, and the government stays open, then there may be funding for FEMA. So we, 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 we would know sooner if we would get reimbursed or how much we'd get reimbursed. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar, I apologize. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And to Mr. Peterson's point, I think we all still understand that everything we have heard described about the reimbursement process for FEMA is that it is onerous and time consuming and that it might be years before we get reimbursed. And I know we passed an emergency ordinance to free up I think it's about $8 million that we tr typically keep in reserve um, to try to fund things and to, um, you know, we're trying to keep all of our costs segregated so we know what can be eventually attributed to the earthquake. And I'm sure you're doing the same thing. Um, but I, I do think it's going to be quite a long time before the FEMA money starts coming to us. I mean, Puerto Rico is still waiting for a lot of their FEMA reimbursement. They might never come. Um, Houston, uh, from the very large uh, storm that they had, is still waiting to recover. So um, it, it might be a while. But to get back to the bear point, um, we had a very interesting, we've had a couple interesting presentations from uh, David Battle, who is our um, biologist uh, in this area, uh, focusing on game. And one thing he said is that uh, there actually hasn't been, you know, it's a little unclear if we actually do have more bears now than we used to. It's just people seem to be less tolerant of bears, partly because of our changing population, partly because of our population density, and partly because of the ring doorbells and other things like that, where doors, bears used to walk through neighborhoods all the time during the day and no one would even notice that they were there. Now everybody sees it on their phone or they put it on Facebook and there's these videos of bears. Everybody's like, oh, there's bears in the neighborhood, where before the bears would just sort of pass through. Um, but I, I am sort of curious, going off of Mr. Weddleton's question about how, you, you know, we are looking at ordinance that puts a lot of the onus on the uh, residents of Anchorage, and that's certainly part of it. But I think there's also a role to be played by the waste utility. Uh, and so I'm curious about um, the availability of bear resistant containers in the Matsu, or if private individuals are doing things that seem to, um, you know, less often uh, lead to uh, lead to uh, bears coming in. Uh, I know Juno, I think, uh, has taken a pretty aggressive approach when it comes to bear-resistant containers. But I'm curious if there's been anything that best practices that Matsu might be able to share with us. Yeah, um, I, I both he and I were born here in Alaska, but I I hadn't thought of it that way. It may be that. The bears in your area, in such a low density area, have a bunch of other alternatives and they don't pick that one. Whereas if you get a bear that's in an urban environment, they don't have choice, like the trash is what they can find. And so, do you do bear resistant containers at all in the Matsu? Um, public at our parks, they are. But not but for not individuals. Private. Okay. Enough about bears, Mr. Weddleton. You want to do more? Well, I. Ah, you want more. Okay, yeah. Mr. Mayfield. I, you know, I, I lived. Uh, I lived in Anchorage for about 30 years, and I saw more bears uh, on the east side of town than <laughs> I have ever seen uh, up in Big Lake for the past 15 years. So, um, so you know, I think it is that they have more wildlife opportunities. They can go kill a moose. They can, you know, find some, some something else to eat. Uh, but uh, we don't take any special precautions other, other than, uh, you know, you don't set your uh, trash out of the front porch, obviously. Uh, Eagle River would like to speak, Ms. Wimhoff, and then uh, Mr. Dice. Yeah, I think I think one of the things we need to remember too is that we do, as a municipality, move into the valleys. Um, we do touch the Chugach State Park. We do have protected areas within Anchorage, even if it's the BLM areas. Um, we have lots of green spaces and creeks that um, have fish, and I, I think that it is that combination of, of more densely populated area. But I think we're also moved into and right next to and within the natural habitat, more so because we are right within the mountains and within the, you know, the streams that have fish. And, yeah. And, uh, Jim, you said we had a mutual interest in fish. Does that already get covered? 
Don, you, you don't get to do the agenda. <laughs> um, he wants to move off bears. That's fine. We'll move off bears. I was going to say it's 1 o'clock. We're scheduled till 2, and we've done about half of the issues that people identified. So we want to keep it moving. I, I thought we might have too much time, but we're, we're filling it up. So I was, I was teasing Mr. Dyson. Uh, you, fish is next? Yeah? Is that what you wanted next? Fish. Bears and then fish. Yeah. Yeah. Um. We have some of the tastiest fish around, but uh, the n numbers are going down. I just wanted to uh, just bring this up very briefly. The borough in 2007 formed a, a Blue Ribbon Commission, Mayor's Blue Ribbon Commission on Fish and Game. Uh, it's, it's morphed into a, an actual advisory commission, and uh, the commission can directly um, deal with the Board of Fish. It's advisory to the manager, but through the manager and to the Board of Fish and legislature and any, anybody else, Fish and Game. And it's, uh, our group has, uh, well, some of the one member has been here since 1962 and was working for Fish and Game then, and some of these same problems are here. But um, what we do share an interest in fish. I run into people from Anchorage when I'm dip netting down in Kasilov. Um We do now have some new dip netting in the, in, uh, the borough that looks like it's going to rebuild. But basically, there are 14 what they call streams of concern. That means it's sort of a pre-endangered species designation. It means you need to restore your fish. So we have eight of the 14 in the state of Alaska, and it's just sitting in a basin. And uh, our, our, the amount of fish that we have has declined mightily over the past 40 years. And uh, But we think there's uh, uh, things to, that we can do to restore. Um, um, it's a fully allocated fishery in Cook Inlet. Um, if, if you uh, if you get into an allocation issue, somebody's going to lose. Somebody's going to get something. Um, but we uh, we do have the ability to restore the fish. So the, our fish commission, and I don't know if you want to get involved, but we certainly welcome your input. You have an advisory committee to the board of fish. I, I certainly encourage anybody, whether they're a sport, dip net commercial, set net, anything else, get involved because uh, the federal government is now in the process of considering whether to take over management of Cook Inlet. And uh, it's, it's a, a potentially very big change. Um, I don't have anything against the drift net community, but they, the, these are the people who sued to make the federal government consider this, and they had uh, everybody but one in their sub-advisory committee that just met. and. Um, and there's a lot of sport fish and personal use fishing and set netting that go on who really weren't represented on this advisory committee. So I think they're going to open it up. Um, they had a, a, a tough meeting um, where they didn't get much done. They, they kind of said, well, shoot, you know, we don't, we don't care about your federal rules. We want to do what we want to do. But, but that's, that's what most fishermen are, are about. But um, um, they're going to have two more meetings before April 1st. So I would invite people who are in this, uh, in, in, uh, who care about fishing, any kind of it, to be involved. Um, we uh, succeeded in 2014 in getting something called a corridor, conservation corridor concept. So when some of the fish are running that we expect are coming to the northern waters, um, some of the uh, drift netters need to fish closer to shore because we know that the, the destination fish are going to go to their streams of destination. And while there aren't as many of them to fish as easily, um, it's working pretty well. We are starting to restore stuff. Uh, the, we've been very successful at the three big uh, deficits that we have in the Matsu, uh, and they're, they're really more limited to the population areas, but. Um, uh, salmon culverts. We have more in the nation than anybody else and, and continue to go that route. Elodia, the invasion of Elodia, we've, uh, we've had some success in eliminating it. It, it isn't in too many places, but we've learned that it's, every lake is not the same treatment. Every lake is an individual lake and it has more streams coming in and going out. We're learning about that. And uh, the other one is pollution. That mainly is only occurring in the more urbanized areas, and we're, uh, a lot has been done on that. But by and large, the, the, the large fisheries, the Yetna, Susitna system, and all of its tributaries are very important. And, uh, and so uh, if we're going to continue to have 
since the fishery is totally allocated and we're experiencing a low part, we actually are asking um, people uh, to make sure that they may give up a little bit of potential catch in the middle of the inlet. But if we are successful in restoring our fisheries, it's the only way that we can bring more fish for everybody. And that's, that's the end. So uh, the main part of the commission has been to get grant funding. A lot of the grant funding we've got with the Salmon Partnership and others uh, has gone directly to Fish and Game to gather uh, uh, research and evidence and information. And the genetic genetic research that they're, they're doing is incredible. And we are learning where our fish are going, and where the ones even out, <laughs> we even know we've got fish out in Port Muller and Kodiak and all over the place uh, due to these genetic studies. But we're trying to take the politics of fish, which is always nasty. It doesn't make any difference which fish are you talking about, but it's always nasty politically. But we've tried to minimize that by saying, let's gather the evidence, let's focus on the problem, and see if we can find a better way. And this, this has been one of our biggest successes. We need to keep it going. Um, and it, it seems to be working. So I just would say, if you would like to become involved, talk to your advisory committee for the Fish Board of Fish. You're welcome to our meetings. They're generally the third Thursday of the month uh, at the borough building. And uh, the Board of Fish, the, the, big, the big meeting is in 2020. And so there's a lot of uh, preparatory uh, stuff that goes on. There's, there's actually a, a regional meeting happening next month. But um, the fishing and uh, the, some of the pollution we've, we've talked about and the potential development that we have, Donald Creek, the pipelines, all of these things are going to intersect. And um, uh, most people like, uh, like fish, and I, I just wanted to put that out there because we, our, our, our commission has been very successful at trying to implement something in a, in a non-threatening political environment that can be very threatening. But I defer to my much more knowledgeable <laughs> fisher right over here. Dyson. Well, good, good job. And, uh, we are in this together. We only have three streams here, I think, that have much of this. Okay. And I, it seems to me we're doing all we can to limit the damage and improve it, short of blowing up a dam or two. And, uh, um, but your point is that w there are so many particularly sport, personal use, and maybe some commercial fishermen in our area, that we have a dog in the fight, and that we ought to be cooperative. Uh, what should we do besides listen and learn and try to fix our cricks? Um, you, 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 yeah, exactly his question. You said you have your own commission. You listed for us here. I appreciate it. Oh, we have an advisory. I should know, but... We have a seat on the state. What do we have? Well, they, they have. Uh, there are local advisory councils for both fish and game all over the state, and Anchorage has its own advisory council that, that forwards its input to the uh, board of fish. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think it's a very active one. Uh, was the last uh, uh, board of fish commissioner came from Anchorage, and I think he had been on the advisory committee before he went to the board. Um, um, but uh, it, it's uh, letting. Uh, it, it does, uh, usually this stuff does come down to money, and I would say that making sure that the uh, Fish and Game Department has the resources and understands the need to do the research. I mean, um, uh, if, you care, if you care about fish, you need to start uh, taking an interest in saying something about it because it's not a uh, guaranteed sustainable uh, resource unless we pay attention to it. Sir, uh, I suggest you have that group come and make a presentation to Yeah, I, I love it. I just made a note, I, my ignorance, but I didn't know we had one, so let's hear from him. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had Mr. Dunbar. No, Ms. Wimhoff. Just a quick question. The members, um, thank you. Just a quick question. The members on the committee, does this include also members from um, Native corporations in the area? Trump. Such as Aklutna? And the reason I bring that up is um, I, we know that Aklutna is working to quietly and naturally um, bring fish back to Aklutna River. Um, and start was, of course, getting that dam out of the way. And it's going to take a few decades, but their, their concept is always 
to be bringing nature back and not interrupting it. And so I'm um, just thinking that that kind of spirit is a great spirit to bring to this because it is not political. So I added to my note, uh, find out who's on the Fish and Wildlife Advisory Commission from Anchorage and is it gluten a, got a seat or not, or, yeah. I would ask that, I would also add that um, uh, our, uh, somebody from our Fish and Wildlife Advisory Commission would be happy to make a presentation and uh, um, we, we indeed actually gave them uh, 10 or 15 minutes and we met with all of our valley legislators and uh, yeah, it was greatly appreciated by the legislators and the Department of Fish and Game. So, uh, We'd be happy to, to uh, provide somebody if you want to talk about it for a few minutes. Brilliant. That's fabulous. We did bears and fish. Can we solve homelessness? We have an hour. <laughs> did you want to wrap up on fish or bears or I'll fish? I'll do that real quick. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I don't know a lot about fish that gave us up, but I went to that advisory committee a couple times in the last three months to talk oh. about bears because that's also a thing. And it's uh, probably 15 people on it. Wow. And they sure seem to know what they're talking about. Okay. And they were thrilled to have someone from city government show up at their meeting. So I think, um, so I'd send you the, con the contact. Form. Yeah, I'd love to. It sounds fabulous. I'll send it around to everybody. We can ambush them. Um, Mr. Rivera on homelessness. Uh, so I didn't bring up the to topic because I talk about it way too often. But uh, Senator Dyson did. And I think your question, Mr. Dyson, was um, what is the Matsu doing about homelessness? Is there a problem? Is there a problem? Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> well, I imagine it has a different character from our problem, but I don't know. So I'd be curious. Yeah. Bert, can, you, can you address? Do you know what 40,000 out of 50,000 people were coming on buses? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I would say probably not on the level you guys do, not even close. And um, let's see, politically, I probably don't want to say anything more than that. But um, no, we don't. We, we don't have near the, the level of problem. I mean, are, is there homeless people out there? Channel two, channel eleven come, comes out every year, and I tell them the same thing same story and they leave uh, and that is we have people that choose a lifestyle okay there's some people who want to live on the streets we know every person inside the city limits that it is living on the streets and we have facilities we have outreach uh, opportunities that we can get them people help do you have a regular shelter or you just do it dispersed there's shelter space available yeah. yes there's not extra shelter space available because I don't think anybody being shipped out but um, so, but there, there, there are people, and they'll tell you, say, look, I, I like my lifestyle. And you can't make somebody go, go to a shelter. And if we can't fix it out there, I mean, and people know, I mean, I mean, it, it's a small state. People know that they have the option that, you know, for a $5 bus ride, you can come in and you can be part of the larger system in here if we can't fix it. Uh, we have had people come in for the, I didn't know we were the banana belt as much as we are. I mean, we have had homeless people move in from Fairbanks and stay for the winter and then go back to Fairbanks. And, and, and so I, I kind of understand that. Um, but, yeah, no, we, not on the level you do. I mean, I don't know about, and I can say Palmer has probably not near the level you guys do. But anyway, so, no, we don't. Mr. Sykes and then anyone else on homelessness? Um, for, for people who are interested in it, I would I would recommend contacting the school district. They have some pretty, they I, I can't remember, it's five or six hundred kids uh, every night are cat serving. So there there is a, a problem out there. Um, and uh, we do have something called My House. It's a, a place that uh, people can go and uh, try and get another start. And it's, it's a private it's a nonprofit. And uh, we do have another brand new shelter. I can't think of the name. But um, we're just dipping our toe into the resources of starting to deal with it, but I think the problem's been there for a while. Mr. Sumner, did you have, I couldn't tell. Sure. Yeah. Well, I, I think some part of that is that housing is also significantly cheaper out in the Matsu, um, which I, I, I just wanted to bring up a point. And there was a builder recently uh, in the news out Eagle River, are you guys looking at expanding the municipal uh, safe, uh, building safety zone to include Eagle River Chugiak? Or yes. Uh -oh. <laughs> There's your absolute answer, no and yes. Um, 
there, there is discussion about that. Yeah. There's discussion. discussion. Yeah. But there's, there's going to be a lot of discussion from different parts, probably. Of course, me and the Matsu would love you guys to drive up housing prices in Anchorage even more. Uh, <laughs> well, you <laughs> Especially me. <laughs> but, yeah. Is that what you <laughs> deal? <laughs> 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 Are you a home builder? Yeah. yeah, yeah okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so long as you don't come to the state of the feds when the earthquake destroys the houses that are outside the building safety area. We uh, okay. It's a big issue that's been come out. The, I mean, a leader for it was an opiate and heroin crisis, an opiate crisis that we didn't see coming and that hit us. <coughs> hit us before it started coming. We, the statistics statewide that I saw was four or five years ago, we had about a third the national average in heroin death. Any heroin overdose death is a tragedy, but we were, it was not, we were significantly less affected by it than the average nationwide. Now we're two to three times. And so in a, and I've seen police officers have testified and talked to me that one of the things we think that happened is the West Coast distributors of heroin realized that if you can sell it for X on the street of LA, you can sell it for two to three X in Anchorage and 10 X in Bethel or Queethland. And um, even though we're a relatively small market, you can make a serious amount of money. And so whatever combination of things happened, it, along with other things, just swamped some of the services and fences we had put up. And uh, yeah, Mr. Just, Rivera. just to add a different perspective of color, um, uh, I would agree with those generalities, but I would also say that uh, communities of color saw this coming way before the rest of the country did. Um, okay, the issues I had left, and we are sitting at, again, I didn't, I didn't know whether we'd fill this, but we seem to be doing a good job. I have snowplow DOT, earthquake, maybe we did that, semi-rural versus or rural, trash and recycling, and wildfire, which should we prioritize? I, I'm so sorry, I did not catch your ice number. I wanted to make a closing comment on this. On this, oh, that'd be yes. fine. Thank you. I, I also wanted to think about something that's different about Alaska is that we have boats and small airplanes that do not need to be checked, that can just fly from here to there. Um, they can transport money so that money doesn't have to go into banks. Um, money can be used to, to launder in different areas. Um, and I, and I, I think we should not ignore that that is something um, that we have that makes it easier um, to, uh, to be able to fly stuff up, let's say, to Kotzebue. And as you just mentioned, all of a sudden things are of great value in the villages that you can get to. Um, I, I, and I'm telling you this from having heard it from someone who's done it, um, that you can uh, get on a snow machine and go to a village and come back. And you will make um, several times the amount of money that it costs to get up there to do it. And, and I think it's because our transportation methods are so free um, because of the nature of our state. And, and that's just something we should remember, that a small craft is not going to be watched like a large fishing boat. And a small airplane will be not have TSA going through it. Anyway, thank you. All right. Mr. Peterson, I don't like it, but I understand it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, oh, we are um, in a unique situation here in Anchorage. Uh, uh, we're the fifth largest uh, air transport hub in, in the world as far as freight's concerned. And uh, when Senator Ted Stevens was uh, one of the leaders in the U.S. Senate, he, he managed to get our uh, uh, airport exempted uh, from searching through all this cargo that is flowing through uh, the, the airport in Anchorage. And so um, some of the fentanyl that's coming into this country could be coming in through Anchorage International Airport, and we're not aware of whether it is or isn't. And uh, so that's a, a, a situation we find ourselves in that we, we may actually be uh, part of the problem or a, a big part of the problem. But we, we are, we're not sure because we're not searching those planes. We're to see if we can find that thing at all. Just wanted to make you aware of that. Thanks. Appreciate Never it. give me a mic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
What issue on the remainder is most interesting to people? Or shall I just go down it? Snowplow DOT was the next on my list. We kind of covered it on roads. Okay. Um, can you articulate uh, the question or the issue on how do you deal with, I, I think we're dealing with a largely urban or semi-rural with a little bit of rural, and they're the flip side of that coin. But take it away. Yeah, what, what, what was that question? Yeah, I suspect everybody understands the issue, and, and uh, none of us can solve it. Uh, I have friends out in the valley, down Kent Goose Bay Road, absolutely don't want the borough or any city telling them what to do on their land, and they're absolutely upset that a, uh, a cremation center went in next door to and they're on the downwind side. <laughs> Classics. I don't want regulation, but I don't want those folks over there. Yeah. Let's not plan. But anybody from Mass who have any insight on the long term ways we can work with that or help to move that kind of yeah, issue? That's cognitive dissonance, and not the technical. Term. I think so. What we deal with it some a lot in Eagle River, some in South Anchorage, some that. Upper Rabbit Creek. Yeah, right. But you guys deal with it, I think, a, a lot more. Um, got any lessons for us? Yeah. Well, one thing that that uh, Natsu has done is um, is we automatically have a sense of community. So we're a size of a population. Excuse me land mass size of West Virginia. So we have um, Calquitas, we have Willows. So the fact that schools or libraries have become a hub in those communities, you know, for resources. And also too, because we have um, fire service areas, because we don't have fire service uh, um, authority, we have fire service areas that also provides that. So there's an automatic outreach. But we do have a challenge and we've been trying to provide government services uh, it's probably different here in, in Anchorage when you go to municipal building, but usually when people come to the Matsu Borough building, they don't want to be there, and they're not real happy about it. And so if you're in Talkeetna, you got to drive two and a half hours to get there. So we have been really been trying to do, technologically, make it easier for people to do business with the, with the borough at home. Um, and the smart communities, we are partnering with, um, with your um, IT team here, um, the state of Alaska, and we're making in incremental progress. In fact, we're making great progress, and then we got hit with a cyber incident. Um, and so our focus, instead of it being push, 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 it's now it's like, okay, let's take smaller steps, and now we're more in a protective mode. Um, but, you know, and, and the Valley folks are there because they want to be there, and that's, I think that's great, because anywhere else in the country, people are there that want to be there. If you want to be in the valley, you really want to be in the valley if you're there. There's, there's so many other options for you. And so I think we're providing the lifestyle. We're just um, not getting all the services, but I think with, with the libraries that's been built, um, with the fire stations, um, and even the schools. I think up in Glacier View, the school has become a hub. Um, I think that's there. a big, like, service area is a big part of that board. I think you're right, right? It's why Eagle River and South, those areas guard their service areas so, so um, vigilantly. It's a way to be part of the thing, but I still manage my own stuff, right? Um, yeah. We have, yeah, we have a, a, a strong portion of our community who, like Mr. Dyson said, does not want any government involvement. I think if the until there's a, sim, a cremation thing next door, but yeah. Well, you know, I mean, something. But I mean, right now, I believe that all the growth that we have um, down the KGB area, around the golf course, probably about 22,000 people, if they would incorporate, I think that would be the second largest city in the state. They don't and, and, they, and there's they absolutely they no interest. Big Lake tried to incorporate. Um, that went down significantly. And, we, and when I was working at the group, <laughs> I thought this is gonna go because it was, it was small. It was just, we're gonna take over just a couple services. Um, and keep the kick the rest of the services. So if it, more self control, and that's where, especially at the rail corridor, 
that got soundly defeated. So I think our residents are exactly where they want to be as far as um, keep the manager out of my neighborhood. Yeah, yeah Mayor Con. So I've attended all the borough assembly meetings for the last eight years. And a, a prior mayor made an interesting comment. There was somebody there talking about a service area and similar to what uh, Mr. Dyson had said, somebody was complaining about one of their neighbors. And the mayor at the time made an interesting comment. He goes, if you want rules and regulations, move inside the city limits. If you want to build a, a house and all you need is a driveway permit, you need to live in the borough. And, so, and, that's, and that's basically the attitude. And, and, but at the same time, when you see development, when you see the commercial districts, okay, so the borough has an inventory tax. They do an inventory tax every May of each year. The last inventory of the tax they did was in May of 2018. There was $88 million in inventory in the valley fit in that category. Well, so and Palmer combined was almost 75 to 78 percent of that. So if you want the business districts, you're inside the city. So we're the downtown anchorage. We're the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh avenue of, of the valley is it's the two cities. And, and the, there's three cities have all agreed on what our roles are. So Anchor, uh, Palmer is basically on a county, you count up the county seat. Okay, so that's where you go for your divorce license, your marriage license, your government services. Well, so is a shopping district. That's what we are. We're a shopping district. Big Lake. We don't have strip joints. Mm. Ah. Strip mall. They're <laughs> <laughs> in the borough. That's okay. That's okay. What, what's your tax base in Anchorage? I'll match you tax bases. Our tax base counts because we don't have property tax because of being, you call it whatever you want, but because we are the, we are 66% of all shopping is done inside the city limits. I mean, we're, we're 66% six, we're of all inventory is inside the city. We're getting first signs, and there's a reason. We just had a meeting with a guy who wants to do an 11-story wind tunnel for skydiving. It would be the first one in the state. And when they come to Anchorage, they're told that, and we appreciate this, <laughs> they're told it's 8 to 10 months if you get a permit. We can get a permit in Valley in two months. So I can tell you where the economic development is. So let me ask you a question. How many square miles is Anchorage? You guys should know this. How many square miles? 1190. Yeah, it's 1,965, I think is what the answer is. You know what we are? 24,000. So I'm going to tell you who's going to win the race eventually, okay? We're, yeah. We're going to do a Mark on dog in, please. Okay. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. But I'm just saying, but that's part of what's unique about the Valley. Big Lake it is recreational. We're not recreational. Houston is industrial. We're not industrial. Talkeetna is tourism. Talkeetna has the market on tourism. And so, I mean, we all kind of know what our niches is, and, you know, and we, we've done, since I've been there, we've done five different annexation projects of where people come in. One has made the annexation list out of five. And because of what Mr. Moosey has said, people like no rules and regulations, and when they want them, you know, the one we did was a 70-acre one-track parcel <coughs> because of taxation, because we're the cheapest place for taxes. We're 13 mills. I don't know what you guys are, depending on where you live in your service district. I guarantee you're higher than 13 mills. And it's because of sales tax. I didn't know you guys were so organized, divided up on duties. We're, we're not. <laughs> Sound, it sounded pretty thought out. Um, great. So um, did that wrap up? Yeah. Can we move on? Yeah. Um, I had wildfire. I'm not sure who put it on. John. Great. Uh, before I get to wildfire, I want to warn you. So you're like upgrading your services and getting real electronic and stuff like that. If someone ever comes and says, hi, I'm here with SAP, here to help. <laughs> Just, um, yeah. Close the door, lock it, lock it. <laughs> um, so wildfire, you guys have wildfires occasionally, and we yeah. have not had too many here. We had one in McHugh Creek a couple years ago that was a wake up. We got lucky with that because the winds were blowing the right way. So um, so we have, about 15 years ago, we were all excited about it. It's on the hillside and we're thinning lots and cutting down trees stuff like that. And then we got mellow about it. We're starting to ramp up a little bit more excitement as spruce bark beetles are coming back and so are, are you guys, do you have an ongoing program or what are you guys doing about wildfire? Mr. Moosey? So, so we were doing um, some about wildfire because we were getting the, um, the, the wildfire mitigation grants, that sort of thing, I think for state and fed, those that kind of stuff. But, you know, just kind of like 
you know, we have the, the road service areas. That we also have fire service areas. So outside those fire service areas, it's forestry. So when we had the big sockeye fire, um, that was 10,000, 11,000 acres, Patty? 7,000. 7,000. Seven, 7, seemed like 10, but it's only 7,000. <laughs> Forestry kind of led that, and they, they brought in, you know, that sort of thing. So we do have a serious beetle kill, and um, we do have forests, and we're trying to manage those forests with no money other than do timber contracts, but that's our problem. If there's no market, then we're, we're just leaving that up to chance, to be honest with you. Mr. Sykes. <coughs> Yeah, wildfire is uh, pretty much a state thing. Um, when spring rolls around, uh, it is the state that uh, advises us when things are getting dry, and the borough does participate and call a uh, no burn days, you know, an on site burning. Um, that's one of the things we do. We do have a tremendous amount of beetle kill. Um, I just noticed my own trees, I'm on I'm in the highest house on uh, Lazy Mountain. Uh, off the grid, but um, the, the spruce beetles are making their way there. They're a half a mile away right now, and uh, there there have been lately a lot of workshops, and the state is putting them on, and they're 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 going they're they're taking the show on the road about what to do about the spruce bark beetles and uh, prevention, and um, uh, you know when we had the uh, fire uh, outside of Willow, uh, you know. When you've got uh, a large overgrown forest and you've got especially black uh, spruce, yeah, you know what firefighters call black spruce? Candles. <laughs> you know, and so uh, um, it's, um, we, we just have so much land that is uh, being affected that uh, the, the, uh, the management of the wildfires is really uh, mostly a state matter. Okay. Mr. Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, what the uh, Anchorage Fire Department will do is if, uh, if you live in an area uh, where you have, uh, that's forested uh, near your house, like in Hillside or Eagle River, if you call the, the local Anchorage Fire Department, they have a gentleman that will come out and uh, tell you what to do to, to make your house more defensible against wildfires. Uh, you know, uh, which trees to, that have to go and which bushes should should not have been there in the first places and that, and that kind of thing so that if a wildfire comes along you might have an opportunity to save your house um, but you know obviously if the winds are in the wrong direction and the fire gets started uh, you know hillside is maybe not the place to be in Anchorage well we had a very personal experience uh, um, somebody's uh, trash fire that was burning on a day that it was not supposed to be burning, got away from them on Lazy Mountain. And we got a very ringside view. We were, I was building my straw bale house, and the slurry bomber that was attacking the fire drove, <coughs> made the turn over our house to hit the fire, which was about a mile and a half away. And uh, the, the local community tried to establish the area as a firewise area, just for the very things that um, Pete just mentioned. And a lot of people have started to do those on their own, but we couldn't even get a firewise area after we nearly had a, a, a serious fire and there was only one road out. And so um, I think people are taking this to heart uh, now that the, the spruce bark beetle is a, a bigger problem. But because it is so, we, we do have the brush trucks that now that the state fire service has. They, they, they have these brush trucks that can go out and they, they've got a limited amount of water but now we have some of the same sort of fire trucks in the fire service areas. And uh, the reality is, is if, if I have a fire, the, uh, one of the fire department members says, well, you know, call, we'll respond to your 911 call. But if you don't put it out yourself, all we're gonna do is put some water on the ashes when we get there. And so there's a motivation to be self-protected. Uh, Ms. LaFrance, you pass it on now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a question for Mr. Lindsay, actually. Can you hear it? Okay, now that's better, I guess. 
Um, can you say more about how your fire service areas work? Because you mentioned you don't have authority, but you have a fire service area, and does that impact of this stated lack of authority or whatever? Does that impact your ability to come up with preventative programs and to work with some of the state um, agencies as well? Um, so, so how how it works is pretty much if we don't have a, um, authority, and, and Nick can really address this, you, we can create any type of area, take it to a vote, and then in a citizens' vote, yes, and we can do it. We've done that for sales tax in Talkeetna just two two years ago. Um, we've done it for um, for fire. Uh, we've done it for uh, we could do it for police services if that that came. So it, it's, it's pretty easy to do. You just need to get the local electorate in that boundary to vote in favor of that. And essentially, it's a passing district. It really doesn't because um, um, the Department of Emergency Services falls under me, and so we have a director, and then we have a head over all the fire um, um, services, um, and then we also have EMS. Um, a director over EMS. So um, they do. We do all the training together. Um, we really kind of coordinate. The really the only difference you you have is who's servicing that district, and um, and how how much tax availability they have. Um, but we pretty much work in unison with both the RSAs and FSAs, especially in the uh, fire service area uh, and EMS. Could you just put yeah. So then the entire borough has fire protection coverage then, and so that's not an issue as far as wildfire um, prevention? Um, so, so we do not have total coverage of our 24,600 square miles. We have pockets that have the protection. So if you're outside those pockets, you don't get fire service. If you're outside those pockets, you don't get road service. Um, and so those areas are just are just you know just left up to to nature or state forestry, um, and state forestry I think does a good job and they bring the type two teams up and uh, really do in fact they do incredible incredible work. Yeah, Mr. Dunbar, you should be on one of those type two teams. Oh. They're fun. Um, so I I have a question on the EMS and how that works. You know, you, you have a heart attack or a stroke in Anchorage, and there's a good chance it's going to be the fire department that shows up. Um, so if you are way down one of these roads in the borough outside the city limits, you call 911, where does the ambulance come from exactly? How, how does EMS work in some of the more far-flung regions of the Matsu borough? Dan, do you want to take that? I feel like I'm talking sure. way too much. Dan has quite a bit of experience with that. <laughs> We, um, we, we currently have four full-time ambulances to service the entire Massey Valley. 24,000 square miles? Yes. Oh, good. So, um, so we, uh, we, we do play a little bit of a chess game with them, and uh, when one has to run to Wasilla, uh, to service Wasilla, we may have to take one from West Lakes and move that into a more moderate position along the road or some other area. It, so that we can cover an additional call that may come in. Um, obviously, we're very uh, we're very short on on being able to service the public that way. There is a um, there is a current plan to uh, to increase our ambulances and EMT teams. Um, uh, I'm sorry. We'll, when you say hour, we'll, we'll be talking mean exactly. about that at the next budget. When you say hour, you mean the miss the borough. Government or yes. the fire the borough, department? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the they, borough separates between EMS and fire. No fire coverage, but borough-wide EMS. Which is right. We yes, also yes, have. Correct. EMS is uh, yes. comes out of general fund, um, sure. and uh, our fire uh, fire response comes out of fire service area. Okay. But uh, you know we're hoping for some some great improvement uh, so that we can. Uh, increase response time and, and serve the public better. Guys, we've been going for two and a half hours. I'm going to get close to wrapping it up. Be careful on the highway out there. Let's uh, wrap up this issue. Then I'll be any other comments that anyone wanted uh, to make. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll have closing remarks.
can't get out of these type of meetings without it, I don't think. Uh, on just this to follow up on the EMS, the, uh, the dispatch will triage as much as they can. So if it's clearly an EMS call, only EMS will go, but sometimes the fire is dispatched along with the call in the case of an accident. And uh, and sometimes if it's a real remote area, it may they may just call a life bed and see if the weather's good enough for them to fly. So it's quite a variety. Well, all I was gonna say is thanks to the Mass Suit Bureau for giving the training and OJT for Dina. Yeah. 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 We appreciate it. Um, those were the issues I had. I actually had trash and recycling, but I'll save it till, till next time. Do you want there to be a next time? Mr. Chair? Yeah. If, if I may. Your amazing clerks, myself, Lisa Schlusner, Lonnie McKechnie, have already discussed a proposal for a next time. We would like to propose Thursday, August 29th. It looks like Thursdays work well for both of us. By the way, Lonnie and I have been trying to schedule this meeting since last May, and it took us until now, but it looks like Thursdays work well for both assemblies, so that's what we're proposing. I think if you have a date, and then you can include that in your comments, yay or nay, or sooner or later, but that's what we'd just like you to think about, Mr. Chair. So that's August, that's a ways out. I was thinking April after our election so you could meet the new crew, April or May or whatever. But it, but it's also a lot of uh, time for us to get to you or you to get to us. August, May, never. <laughs> August, we will send around then email proposing that specific time and see if we can get closure that that'll happen. And then you'll have our new ones with a little bit under their belt so they know what they're doing. and. Um, and you can have a productive discussion and with them. Mr. Chair, since we rotate the last time, I believe Mr. Peterson would have been on the assembly, um, but the last time you met at the Matsu Borough New Chambers, and so we met here in Anchorage, so in August you'll be meeting in Matsu. I propose we meet at Sonic. I see the new Sonic. <laughs> so, po propose we meet in Maui. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, are you ready for closing comments then so we can go home? Clo assembly closing comments, and we'll go clockwise around here. We will. Um, we are reminded of it by the same source you are. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, so I want to say thanks to you, uh, the Anchorage Assembly, uh, for meeting with us today. Uh, I think these experiences are great. Gives us an opportunity to share um, the things that are common as well as some of our dis differences. Uh, also, want to thank our, our both the Anchorage clerk and our uh, MSB clerk uh, for setting up the meeting. And uh, by the way, we took the uh, we took a tour of your election center here. Um, looks like you guys have it well planned out. Looks a little expensive to me, yeah. but it's gonna be um, it's gonna be something of a, of a matter of discussion here in the future, I'm sure, as uh, how we can uh, affect the increased voter turnout in the, uh, in the map. I, I do want to follow up with uh, with the Anchorage Assembly on the question of education uh, and funding, uh, I'd be more than glad to work with Mr. Croft and whoever else would like to uh, work on that issue. And uh, I do plan on attending the meeting for February 20th on your course. I'm, I'm interested in uh, uh, ultimately measuring or, or seeing what the effect on uh, the Anchorage, the METSU, and, and in general the state economy. Uh, with that, say, I want to say thank you and hope to everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sumner. Uh, thanks for inviting us out here, um, Anchorage Assembly. Uh, and uh, I'd just like to thank you guys for everything you do. I think the Anchorage Assembly uh, helps out the Matsu economy more than any other single source. <laughs> just uh, keep regulating. Mr. <laughs> 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 Frank. Thank you all those of you who drove out from the valley for being here. And um, 
there was a constituent suggestion that we figure out a way to tax folks who commute from the valley, <laughs> but um, we can maybe put that on the next. Sure, agenda. that'll be on the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> toll road, not a toll, toll road, road, but <laughs> an income tax of some sort. <laughs> anyway, yeah. um, I can make the meeting, and I would like to work with you on the education issue and um, a continued interest too in talking about some of these public safety um, issues. I know Mr. Weddle had. had pointed out how Girdwood dealt with that challenge and along the turning an arm we have residents there who agreed to levy um, a tax for a kitty of a certain amount to respond to um, for police service and everything and we also have been discussing how to deal with a lack of trooper coverage south as well and where our volunteer Girdwood Fire Department gets um, pulled out into calls in the past so I know those are some issues too that will probably you know impact you more and that's soon but thank you for coming look forward to the next meeting Oops, microphone stuck well I, I was happy to see uh, such a good turnout uh, today of members uh, not only from Anchorage but also from the Matsu driving in uh, appreciate your time and effort um, I just wanted to remind people uh, that are that are uh, hopeful that we might get some funding from the state that uh, the governor does have line item veto authority and so I would recommend that you not get your hopes up too high thank you Swim up. thank you mr. chair um, I just have a few things one um, we have a shared house district um, that's house district 12 and I, I think that one of the things that we should consider um, as we go into the state goes into redistricting is understanding that having a shared house district is not necessarily a good thing um, in the sense that it, it makes that person have to um, answer to two large, large government bodies and uh, populations. And so I would encourage uh, that, that that be something that's split um, in our state, we have quite a few districts that are shared because of necessity, but I do not believe, if it's possible, that we should have to share um, between the two largest metropolitan areas on that. So that's one concept that we could think about in the future. Um, and obviously, transportation is my thing. I, I've always felt that if people can get to work, it's better for the economy, it's better for them, they feel they can take care of themselves. People who are happy about themselves make better choices. And I just think that if we can help them get to work and in a place where we live, um, where it is, uh, you almost can't do it without a car, um, we need to really think about it, especially as we grow on that. Um, the other, and the other thing I, I do want to talk about is citizen involvement and diversity. Um, we have a lot of commissions on both sides, and I know that both sides have difficulty sometimes filling those boards and commissions. I mean, at any one time, we could go to our websites and see vacancies. It's not for us not wanting to have more people, but somehow it is an issue. And the more citizen involvement we have, then the more diversity we bring into decision making, and the more diversity, if, considering Anchorage's diversity is, is uh, um, so major, that in our, in our assembly, um, through no fault of anyone on the assembly, um, is, is not as diverse. I think those leaders come up through our citizen involvement. And I think the more we can bring citizens into this world, then they learn that, yeah, I could get involved in this, and then they start running for these seats. Um, right now, um, we're, we're not as diverse as we could be, both gender and um, ethnicity, and relative to the diversity in our, our areas. It's, again, not something we can just do because people elect people. Except me. I just get <laughs> so, Yeah, they don't elect me very often. <laughs> I've been coming the back door. <laughs> anyway, but I truly have appreciated working with you guys. Um, it's really good to see some of these assembly members from you know, Mr. Sykes and Mr. Kendall that I've worked with when I was running for office out there. Thank you for driving in. Um, I'd just like to uh, express my appreciation for having this uh, happen. I, I think that our two boroughs um, and the cities within our boroughs have a lot in common um, with each other. It's better to talk and be aware than not to talk. Uh, and uh, 
uh, I sense uh, a lot of goodwill in solving our common problems, and I hope that the uh, meetings continue, and um, uh, I, I'm really glad that we could do this, and I look forward to the next one, which will be my last one. Thank you. Mr. Leonard, go ahead and pass me that. Oh, he's got one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, again, thank you, and thank you to the clerks. One thing I'd ask if we're especially having it out in the borough for our clerks is that, again, it was very helpful to have uh, Mayor Cottle there. Maybe the other two mayors of our cities would be great to have in the discussions if that's possible. And again, I think there are issues that we need to work on together with transportation and economic development and look forward to continuing the discussions. Thank you. Thanks. Um, it was good to meet you guys. I see your names in the paper and <coughs> signs on the highways. I didn't know you really existed. So <laughs> here we are. Um, so it's interesting. Um, in, in regards to Mr. Sumner's points on uh, cost of building regulation, we do have quite a bit more here in our no, public works building. It's known as the building to no know to builders. But we are, I hate to scare you, but instead of three cities doing that, we have one city that is the seat of government, a tourist attraction, and um, whatever the third one was. But um, we are doing quite a lot now to try to fix that so that we become the building of yes and we'll have a cheaper place to live too. I think you guys are doing good just the way you're doing it. Um, anyway, I just want to say thanks for what you said at the big table. Not, and uh, anyway, allow me to have my two cents. Um, but I think there is a lot of common ground. I mean, it's to the valley's advantage if Anchorage does good, and I think it's the Anchorage's advantage uh, for us to do good. Um, I mean, I mean, I think there's what 33,000 cars a day coming back and forth. I mean, when the bridges got shut down, you shut down Anchorage schools because 700 of your teachers couldn't get to Anchorage. I mean, so, so you know, and you got 10% of you know our population out there is military dependents. So I just had a meeting with Jay Bear uh, earlier this week, and I mean, th there's lots of common, you know, lots of common goals that we should work on together. And I hope together, our legislative population and your legislative population can work together to foster some of these goals that it's not so t territorial. I mean, when you talk about kids, roads, public safety, that shouldn't be territorial. I mean, we should all want the same goal. It's just how we get there from A to B to C. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's different on how we want to do it, but as long as we still get to the next goals, I mean, so I, hopefully our delegation, your delegation can work together. Thanks. Senator? I just want to thank the uh, clerk, clerks and other staff that helped make this possible. Other than that, no comment? Yeah, thank you all for being here. Um, we hit the mark just about exactly right. Um, so that, uh, concludes our uh, business. Is there any audience participation? We'd also like to thank you, by the way, uh, for loaning us uh, Mr. Haberman uh, for our meetings. Anybody at all? Would you like to speak, Mr. Haberman? Then you have three minutes under audience participation. Can you hear me? Is it working? Yeah. This way? Yes. Okay, thanks for your assistance. My name is Eugene Carl Haberman, and I represent myself to follow the public process. The public process done appropriate, decision made by the governing body is more likely the public interest. Um, every one of these meetings prior to this, so this joint meeting, so the assembly, <coughs> for both the Metro Borough and Anchorage, there was no place for public comment. This is the first time. So I have to compliment that. But before closing comments should have been, you should have heard from the public, and then you could have responded to what you heard from the public. But that did not happen. Um, I'm going to say something that I didn't expect to say, but, but I, it was in reference to the meeting and what I heard. And that was on the issue of homelessness. Uh, what I'm going to say about that. I heard the question said, is there a problem with the homelessness? And then some the member from uh, Metro Borough said, quote, Oh, not at all. Um, then I heard remarks that were insensitive to the issue of homelessness. 
and there was laughter. And um, with all due respect, this is not an issue that you need to joke about at all. And um, the press is not here. I was here. And by the way, I was here as a member of the public. The whole point of these meetings is you connect with the people. You set this up, where's the public? Time of day, during the week, out of sight. No video audio. I warned the Anchorage Assembly about this, not to do it this way. Um, it's an improvement that you, what, you met at least in Anchorage or the Valley in a way that's at least, but not in the main area. If you're gonna do in the Matsu Borough, use the audio video scenario in the Matsu Borough, send the area. And if you're gonna do in Anchorage, do the Anchorage Assembly, and you're gonna do it, let the public witness what you're saying. I don't think they would have been very happy on the marks on homelessness. And it, they were also, I don't think it was very happy, because what I saw in closing this is that, as you know, I follow closely Anchorage, and I call closely the Valley. But what I saw in this meeting reflects a wall. I know what's going on in Anchorage, and I know what's going on in the Valley. But all due respect, what I was hearing and listening is a isolation between Anchorage Assembly members and Borough Assembly members being ignorant of what's really going on and distant from each other. If I had to sum it up all there, and, and it, it reflects a, a serious problem that you need to tie together more appropriately and also connect with the people. And having these meetings in this time of day, out of sight, out of mind of the public, is not doing this situation any good. And um, I think in all due respect, and just to close this, is that if the public was hearing this, they would, um, I believe, have the same conclusion about the isolation between the Valley and Anchorage. Thank you, Mr. And Haberman. that's it. Any questions? Any, any questions of Mr. Haberman? Any <coughs> other audience participation? If not, thank you, we're adjourned.